And now, holy shit, folks. I always remind people, you know I am suspended for life for minor <laughs> hockey. <laughs> it's my duty to please the booty. Did you catch a rattlesnake and then drive home with it in your car holding it the whole time? Yep. Phil only drinks Coke. He doesn't drink water. I fucking quit. Fugazis. Fugazi. Fugazis. Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 452 of Spit and Checker. Presented by Pink Whitney for my friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here on the Barstool Sports Podcast family. Welcome to our best of this past season. We got some great clips, some great interview segments coming up. Funny stuff happened all year, so we're going to share a little bit now while we're on break. So, gee, let's get cracking. First up, oh, people were mortified when they heard this one from Biz. Guy goes to the bathroom, does not wash his hands, but let's send it over to Biz. He tells it better than I do. There's a oh. lot going on in the league right now. I'm excited. I don't even really want to talk about my personal life much. Although I do have a pretty insane story, and I'm a little nervous to share it. Oh I teamed up with mm. Pasha first. You guys will love this one. Mm. You guys might think I'm a complete fucking lunatic um, for the we way I handle this. Already, that's, that's old news. Okay. Well, to judge my uh, my social skills on this one. So um, I go to, uh, to do my gateway loop hike, as I normally do. I go hiking as a, a de-stressor. I go to work on my breathing, calm myself down, and just like an overall workout. I, 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 I do certain paces. Sometimes I run at the start, but it's ultimately to, to get my mind right. So it's been a pretty crazy couple of weeks, a lot of travel, a lot of doing this, a lot of doing that. So I get to the hike and I got to take a leak. I got my water bottle and it's called the Gateway Loop. I think I might've already mentioned that. It's about five miles. Um, it was Saturday, so a little bit busy. Um, so when I leave the car, like automatically I'm in my head going through my workout and how I want to approach it, whether I want to run the first little bit, uh, this nasal breathing I've been starting to do, I have a horrible nose, eventually going to get the Ryan Kessler, uh, surgery that he got to help his sleeping. But the, the nasal breathing definitely helps me as far as like getting my, my cardiovascular up and it helps me sleep at night. So going to take my piss before the hike, uh, I get in there, there's a guy on, on the right urinal, there's three urinals. So I you know, whip out my horn, start the hose. This guy lets like the biggest fart go. I'm so in my head that I'm just thinking about my workout still dialed in. Another guy walks in on the left. The guy on the right is still there uh, p pissing. I don't know if he had stage fright, whatever it may be. Keep in mind, he's the one who ripped ass. So still in my own head, I finish my piss and I start walk, grab my water bottle off the, 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 like where the sink was and start walking out. I forgot to wash my hands. This guy who ripped that fart goes, dude, wash your fucking hands. So just as Fuck it clicked him, in, dude. bro. Fuck just him. As it, just as it clicked in, I'm like, oh, fuck. And I, and I start washing my hands and he walks up. But when I turned back around the corner, I, I looked over to be like, like, first of all, who the fuck would have like said something like that? And he's like, he gives me the, like the look around and like starts shaking his head while he's still to piss. Then he walks up. I'm washing my hands and I look at him and I say, are you out of your fucking mind? And he's like, what? That's disgusting. Wash your hands. I said, are you out of your fucking mind? And then he's like, what? You turn around and wash your hands. I'm like, buddy, I'm about to go on a five mile hike in the desert, snotting all over myself. And you're fucking worried about me washing my hands. I ain't going out there to dab guys up. I'm going out there to snot on myself and get my fucking workout in. And then, so he kind of kept holding his position on it. Bro, I, I, I'm washing my hands, flicking water in his face, saying, I, is it, I say- Just hope he does something. I, I, How did I, you not I, bring up the fart he just dropped in your mouth? Bro, I was I was on my heels so much, and I, 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 I wanted to knock this guy's teeth out, because I just would mind your and own fucking business. That's not what you business. need pre-workout, right? That's like, buddy. I, I was thinking about it for half the hike, so I'm already rattled. I get, I get out there. The guy who came into the left was a biker guy. So he does the path with the bike and, and he, he was waiting outside the door. He didn't wash his hands either. He just got the fuck out of the bathroom. Cause we were both at the sinks going at it. And finally I walked out. He's like, Oh, he goes, I thought somebody was going to come out sideways. And the way these places are, are built by these hikes, like you could hear everything. And there's like families around, like looking at us when we walk out of the bathroom, I'm ready to kill this guy. And the, the, the biker guy had my back where he was like, what the fuck is wrong with that guy? And of course, just a, a, an absolute Karen type character. He has his family with him. So I, I cooler heads prevail. I thought I said my piece by basically challenging him. I said, on the way out of the bathroom, I'm like, you're trying to shame me. He's like, 
for not washing my hands. He's like, I, I wasn't trying to shame you. I'm like, bro, I turn around the, the corner and you're scoffing at me, shaking your head because I didn't wash my hands before a five mile hike where I'm about to grind my cock off. Like, fuck you, you piece of shit. So sure, sure enough, I figured, hey, I might, might see him as I come around because it's a loop. I, I, I pat myself on the back for this one. His kid says, hey, mister, as, as I'm walking by him, I didn't say a word. The, buddy, the, the old man says, don't talk to him. <laughs> and I, I, I wanted to teach him a lesson and pull his jersey overhead and just feed him some uppercuts because I feel like people get way too comfortable trying to tell strangers what to do in public. So I thought what, I'd what, what was his one, height and weight biz? He was, he was about Not that five. it matters because there's UFC killers who are little. It doesn't really matter, I guess. If you're, if you're a lunatic, you can beat up anyone. But what would he, what would he look like? 5'10", chunkster, love handles, like going out of oh, style. That's the old dummying for you. The, the old muffin top all around him. I could have, I could have done, I probably could have done three full loops of this thing until he d did one because I basically met him at the start along, along the other side. So I just, sometimes like I just feel like people just need to shut the fuck I, up and stay at other people's like, business. What the so fuck? I, does he I just care figured, to wash your hands? Like, oh, I, I, does it boys, make any sense? I, I'm, I'm actually it. shocked that I didn't knock this guy's teeth out. So I'm glad I'm here. I'm glad I didn't. And for those of you who would have knocked his teeth out, maybe try a little bit more hiking, a little bit na more nasal breathing. Uh, Biz, when you say bikers, you mean like Hells Angels or like Greg LeMond? No, they do the, they put their mountain bikes on and they go oh, around because okay. it's a big rock path and, and you can go deeper, you can go deeper into the desert, but I, um, cooler heads prevailed oh that's good take a couple deep breaths flick some water in the guy's face and i think that i got my point across <laughs> if i'm wow. taking a smash i'm washing my hands every time if i'm taking a piss <laughs> rarely if ever come at me if you want i don't give a fuck if, if it's I'm a gross bathroom and it's one of those ones you actually have to flush on your own i'm washing but if i'm just touching my horn unless there's piss all over my hand which i'm an adult so i probably like shouldn't be peeing on myself I'm walking right out of that bathroom. And, and and if somebody said something to me like that, like I'd be the guy to go at him and then get beat up like he's a lefty and pumps my eyes shut. <laughs> Don't be telling me to wash my hands. Seriously, huh? I'm, I must have said, are you out of your fucking mind 40 times? <laughs> and at the point where by the end of it, because he kept trying to push his point, I was yelling. Oh, to, yeah. Like, I was in his face saying, are you out of your fucking mind? Gee, can That's you not type picture of this, how he gets, you know, how he gets angrier and angrier? I could totally see this entire scenario. Yeah, he just, he gets those killer eyes where yeah, he's he just like the, looking yeah, the, the, the wires <laughs> The wires <laughs> cross. So, as Tony Soprano calls them, Manson lamps, like fucking Charles Manson. Okay, I like that. I like that go. term. Oh, Manson lamps. Well, anyway, anyway that, that's all I had really going on this weekend. Uh, had a nice relaxing game Mike. as well. Yeah, just a, just a nice <laughs> relaxing Mur Murdered guy. Murdered a family. I mean, I don't know what more we could add. Just a hilarious story. Uh, Biz almost beating the crap out of a guy because he didn't wash his hands. I mean, I guess the lesson here is mind your business, man. Don't talk to people in the bathroom if you don't know them, but... Next especially, up. especially oh. giant tattooed former hockey enforcers, probably not the right guys to talk trash to in a, uh, in a, in a random hiking spot bathroom. E even more so, G. I I mean, just, just hilarious. Like, like, what do you care? The guy's not, you know, touching you near you, but either way, that's our boy biz. Uh, well, next up for the roasting is me. I shared a few prom stories. Uh, I guess I went to a few proms back in the day and I couldn't believe the response to it. I thought the response was hilarious. Uh, so a few, <laughs> Nine, uh, nine, and then I went 0 for 9. Uh, you know, the old prom prom story, the old prom myth. Yeah, uh, your, your boy R.A. went 0 for 9, although realistically it was probably more like 0 for 3 because six of them I knew not those on the table that night anyways. But uh, without further ado, uh, here are the R.A. prom tales. Let's go. I went to, I went to I think, like nine set, nine different proms. I was oh, like, what I was, a wheel you are, R.A., you <laughs> dog I'm not you. Saying I, I'm not saying I got fucking smashed all of them. R.A., R.A., did like, you get asked by an older girl at a different school to go to her prom? To when go you were, chaperone it? No, oh, I actually, I got a funny story Well, you story went to that. nine. I mean, there's got to be a bunch of different fucking scenarios here. Well, what would happen back in the day, we'd all go on spring break, there'd be kids from Charlestown, South East Dorchester, and you'd meet, you know, different girls, whatever, and you could all come back home and, you'd have, you know, go on a, it wasn't even a date. You just were like a good prom date, not, not even hooking up, just go, he's a good guy, he's a good, good friend time. Friend zone. Take already him went for, on nine friend zone proms. <laughs> <laughs> no, it wasn't, it wasn't friends. It was just like, you'd go just to have a, have a good time. But I will. How many of the nine did you whack? <laughs> um, honestly, 
Not that night, none. <laughs> none. None that night. No, but uh, that one, is a that's fucking insane. insane stat. They were they weren't whackable. I went over they were, nine. <laughs> they weren't whackable like nights. It was the one post prom. Yeah, it was a, a whackable summer, but. No, they weren't like whack. You know, like I wasn't going to hopefully get laid. It was like I girls I hadn't even knew. It was like a friend of a no, friend. No, that's fair. That's fair. Type shit. Uh, but I, I'm not I, trying to sound of... like a chauvinistic pig. I'm not saying no, you'd be no, whacking but, every single one. But no, but that's I, mean, I thought you were batting average one in one in there. Well, yeah, it wasn't that night. Shit. Like I said, the rest of the summer. No, that's the theme. Everyone thinks prom night. You give it up and all. But it actually, kind of a funny story. This is the last one. I was probably a little bit too too old to be going going to the prom. Uh, it was the '94 <laughs> Stanley Cup. How it old? Was, how old are you? How, how old were old? you last prom? Uh, 22. 27. <laughs> 22. 22? That's, yeah. That's no, brutal. It was a cool, listen, <laughs> when I worked at Levitt, that's Leo, illegal, isn't it? R.A. No, R.A. DiCaprio. No, <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, it, when I was working at my uncle's video store back then, and it was one of the girls I worked with, her friend, like, I wasn't, we were, I wasn't attracted how to How was Epstein was, Island, R.A.? Oh, come on. Jeez, geez, you guys would go creep, creep you on me. So my uncle's like, hey, why don't you go to the, the prom with so-and-so? I was like, eh, I'm not really. He goes, uh, I'll give you extra work hours. So, because I, I claimed I was broke. He's like, I'll give you extra work hours so, you know, you can go. And I was like, all right, yeah, I'll, I'll be the nice guy. I'll, I'll go. So, you know, I, I was just going to be a gentleman. And so we walk into the prom and wait, you know who Bob Norton is, right? He used to work, do the yeah. bean pot. He's a local hockey guy. I don't, he hasn't done it for a while. He did that and He would do the bean pot. Now I walk in he's actually the principal of the school of the problem going in the Rangers are playing the Canucks in the Stanley Cup that night. It was one of the first few games. So we walk in and I see, you know, Bob Norton from Ness and, and I was like, and all the kids are on it. I was like, hey, Bob, you got to score in the Rangers game? And, and all the kids were like mortified because I called the principal by his first name. I didn't even know he was the principal. Oh, he was the he was principal. Like, he was the principal of this particular high school. And I walked in and, and asked him again, I wasn't being disrespectful. He didn't French. He didn't give a shit. He's like, no, I haven't heard anything yet. So yeah, I was uh, 22. He's like, uh, hey, uh, Brian, stand over there. I got somebody you want to meet. And then all of a sudden, two police yeah. officers Fucking, are walking over to arrest your ass. Here's one. Here's one. Hey, I, I went to prom one time, Ooh. and I uh, okay. I think I was a junior, my, a sophomore. Why don't you have a seat here, Brian? And we were, we were, we, yeah, why don't you have a seat? <laughs> and we were in the pool after. There was like a bunch of people. I was talking to a girl, and like, I was a buddy around me, too. Dude, I just got rock hard talking to her, and then everyone saw that my boner was just sticking out of my my shorts just from talking to her, and I was made fun of and embarrassed so bad. I think I ended up going home. That's what it's like when you're young, though. Even just talking to a girl, you're just oh, yeah. like you got those young legs. rock hard, just oh, yeah. full of testosterone. I would have been embarrassed. My buddy's chirping. No, I said, "Fuck you." I think it was a little embarrassing. Girl. The girls looking down, and we're talking about science class, and I have a raging heart on in a pool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I mean, shit. biology can do that, man. Yeah, Bi especially yeah, at that it's age. It's not my fault. Yeah. Um, I, I, uh, me and my buddy Jamie Tardiff, we wore the Dumb and Dumber suit star bro. Oh. <laughs> of course, because we're Were clowns. you orange or blue? I was blue, and and uh, and Jamie was orange. So we did that. That was one of the first times I ever got drunk, too. Maybe the first time I ever got drunk was prom off wine. Me too, I think. So, wine yeah. coolers. Me too. No, just red wine. Wow. My, te my teeth were purple red by the end wine? of the night. I was just an absolute mess. Yeah. I yeah. don't think any kid, Ari, I know you're older than me, but like it was just Bud Light. If you grew up in Boston, you just drank Bud Light. It's all I ever remember at any party, just Bud Lights. Keystone yeah, was, Light. I drank a lot of Keystone oh. Light as I was coming What did up, you do for gross. prom, Grinnell? Let me hear the stupid shit you did for prom. Oh, I was hoping you wouldn't ask. I, I went to a, a few proms like RA as well. My kill count was a little better, but I actually, Oof. I fucked up really Sorry. bad. And I actually Serial had killer. to, I got suspended from the lacrosse team my senior year because you wouldn't early, clap. Like, you know, they, they taught you, a girl asked you to prom in like November. So I got asked to prom in like November, come to, she didn't go to our school. So come to find out months later, that was the same day as a lacrosse game. So I, I wanted to skip the prom, but my parents wouldn't let me. They're kind of like, you said yes to this girl. She bought her dress. You can't bail. So I had to uh, miss the lacrosse game, which you was- You skipped a game your senior year to a sport you were going to play in college? Dude, I didn't want to oh do it. God. The problem was Fuck. it was like, I know it was one of those things where it's like I had to do it. Like I couldn't leave this girl out to dry. I had to do be a good person because like- there was I, I couldn't bail on her. Then she goes alone. It it sucked. I wanted to play in the no, game more than anything. But... You're the you're the opposite of uh, GM <laughs> Joe. Is it GM Joe? Yeah, yeah. You're not for the boys. Yeah, you're I for the puss. 
So basically, your last memories of lacrosse were skipping a game senior year and then, and then not quitting clapping. the team like a couple months later in college. I always said I was a what hockey a player that played lacrosse. I was a lacrosse player who, well, I was a hockey player who played lacrosse at the end of the day. Okay. You know what I mean? Like I, I was never really a lacrosse player. But yeah, that was a tough one. I was hoping you guys wouldn't ask. That's not as but tough what would as you guys do? You, you that's would not as tough as going 0 for 9 at prom. I tell you, I don't, I don't think that's going to be trumped. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't care. Like I said, no, I was setting up a, for the summer, though. I had a reputation. Yeah, I have reputation as, as a good, reliable date. Wasn't going to be a donkey. Have a good time. I didn't mind. I like to dance. I, I like to have a good time. I actually I just sent you guys a picture for my my senior prom. You could see how thin and chopped I was looking back. Suits Already suits picks up wear? the girl from prom biz, meets her dad, and then the dad's like, "Dude, you beat me up when I was in middle school when you were in high school." <laughs> oh so my def- god! Definitely what are not we me. looking at. Uh, I'm looking that, at RA's prom photo. You look great here, RA, and you thank match you. her. Yeah, no, oh, that that's a that's actually a, a, one of my shit, oldest RA. Like, good friends. She's like that was totally platonic friend, just an old pal. We've known each other since we were four or five years old. I took her to my senior prom. She took me to hers. It was, yeah, you know, it was just pals just going to the prom. Um, I mean, she must look back at, on that dress and just be like, "What the oh. hell was I?" Maybe that was the well, time. Well, it was yeah, 1990. Well, basically late eighties. Little, that's fuchsia. That's the color I had to so get. So you you were you were a so gal you went pal. to a prom in the late eighties, and then you went to a prom during the ninety four Cup Finals. I I graduated ninety, so what my junior prom eighty nine, senior prom ninety, and then yeah, I I don't know if I went to one every year to ninety four, but ninety four was my last prom uh, during the Stanley Cup Finals. So uh, yeah, it has hey, to it, be some sort of world record going to prom nine times. I don't know what much more to add there. Some people think I'm a perv. Some people think it's hilarious, but I had fun. I didn't bother anybody. Another another couple proms down. Who knows? Maybe I'll do one more before the day's out. The legend of RA grows. The, uh, the legend continues yeah. to grow, baby. Legend, yeah. I don't know how we're using that word, but all right. Next up, the, the wit dog. Uh, I mean, I always get you know dummy for my stories of forgetting stuff and doing stupid stuff on the road, but the wit dog has one every once in a while as well. Like the time he forgot his phone in an Uber. Take it away, wit. Guys, Whit here, and you know it's time to talk some Pink Whitney. Spit and chickle own Pink Whitney. The birdie juice, the sailing juice, the, the fishing juice. You can use it in any single aspect of your life besides driving. The best drink of the summer, of the fall, of the winter, of the spring. It don't matter the season. Listen, I got a lot of people in my DMs saying, Whit, you're talking about Pink Whitney. You're talking about Pink Whitney all over the golf course, all over the beach. How about us lake people? I'm not ever going to forget the lake people again, the pontoon people. We got apparently F1 racers drinking our stuff, G. I know I'm not ready to say names, but apparently we got some F1 guys into the Pink Whitney. So we got fast cars, we got slow golfers, we got crazy ass people on a lake, and we got lunatics out on the beach where the sharks swim because the sharks know what's up too. That's Pink Whitney, baby. It don't matter the event. It don't matter the people you're with. You can be alone. You could be in a group. You could be at a party. Maybe talk to a girl they were too nervous to talk to because of that pink drink, give them a little confidence. You could be at a graduation. Pink Whitney where it's at all sizes one flavor one name pink whitney thank you very much we got to talk about wit losing the phone friday night okay we got to get into it well uber is just full of complete dirtbags and there's some wonderful people that drive ubers i've met some amazing people but some of them are just downright dirty scoundrels and when you so so let me say this um there is no worse setup to get into arena than the Florida Panthers. I mean, I'm talking foolish, ridiculous stuff to try to just get there. There's about 15 different hills you can walk up to. No, they drop us off about a mile from the entrance. Then you got to walk in front of the building. We considered hopping the fence, but we couldn't. So it was about a mile walk from where we got dropped off. I get up to the front where, uh, you know, you got to put your things through the metal detector. I don't have my phone. I said, oh, my God, I need this phone. I'm traveling home tomorrow. Well, Grinelli ordered the Uber, so, gee, you can't go in either because you you have the Uber app. Well, Uber got rid of the ability to call the driver. I don't know if they had people, like, getting to beefs or whatnot. I guess I kind of understand it. So you got to go through the Uber, like, 
Robot. I don't even. It was like yeah, a robot. it's a robot, and so like they're asking us the same questions on a chat. I'm just like, please give us the guy's number. Please give us the guy's number. About an hour and a half goes by. We've now walked back to like that shitbag mall they have across the street from the terrible <laughs> Panthers arena, and we found like uh, what were we at? I don't we know. We were sitting at a yard house. A yard house. Okay. Now I'm watching the skills competition. <laughs> what a skills competition! They shouldn't change a thing. <laughs> so G and I are now in contact with this guy because the Uber robot finally was like, can we share your number with the guy? Well, we remembered on the ride into the arena, he didn't speak a word of English. So I said, oh, fuck, dude. Even if this guy calls, he can't speak English. Well, what does Witty do? I use my brain immediately. And I said to the woman next to me, do you speak Spanish? No. She said, no, you start running around the, the room in there and you're like, who speaks Spanish? Who speaks Spanish? Okay. And finally guess- some lady came over and was like, what's going on, sir? I, I speak Spanish. I can help. <laughs> I guess I didn't word that properly. Lickerdale. This woman was an angel sent from heaven to help me. <laughs> I'm t- I'm, no, I'm not kidding you. One of the nicest, most kind-hearted people. She's working a double at the yard house. All she's thinking about is helping me. She's like, I'll help you, sir. I'll help you. So she's back and forth on the phone with this guy. And all of a sudden, oh, I'm back in Miami already. I'm back in Miami. He's, he, you know, she's, in, she's telling me what he's saying. I'm like, how is he back in Miami already? Like, it's like an hour and a half from here and whatever. So he's like, oh, well, I need money to come back. Which, like, wait, I, I don't wait, know. wait. Meanwhile, we're getting screenshots sent to us from Murley, from all all people who are texting yes. you saying if you want your if your friend wants his phone back, it's going to be a thousand dollars in Spanish, not even in English. Yes. So now I don't oh, know. Sure. Now, technically, that's that's straight up extortion, brother. That's not allowed. Now, if he were to say like, I, I yeah, I want some money to come back. Like, I don't know if that's illegal. Like, does he technically have to come back with my phone because I left it there? I don't know. He could just be like, oh, it's not in the car. I don't know. Like, and he shut the phone. Fo- he shut my phone off, so we couldn't track it by via find my iPhone. So he he finally agrees to come back for two hundred dollars. Now I'm going through the girl the whole time. So I gave. So finally he gets back. Now dude, this is ten o'clock. The skills have ended. Me and Grinelli had a great conversation. Just That's when you were giving me tequila shots and stuff. I was so mad. So he comes back. He comes back finally. She walked me outside. I, I gave her $100. She wouldn't even take it. She was so nice. I, I, I shoved it in her waitress thing. And I said, listen, thank you so much. You're the biggest help. I appreciate it. No problem. She said, don't give this guy $200. She goes, you shouldn't even give him anything. I was like, oh, whatever. I'll give him 100 bucks then. So I go over. The guy who drove us is sitting in the passenger seat like this, smiling with my phone. <laughs> There's another guy driving, and they're both like laughing. I go, "Can I have my phone?" He goes, two hundred bucks." I give him a hundred. The guy driving speaks English. He goes, "No, man, you said two hundred. I go, "Give me my fucking phone back." Like a tough guy, like I would do something. He goes, "No, two hundred dollars." So I go, "Fine. I got a 50. <laughs> gave him 50 more, and he still said, "No, two hundred dollars." And then the guy with my phone goes, "No, no, 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 no. No mas, no mas." and handed it to me. So I finally got it back, but just the whole thing, I didn't get to go into the skills. I missed a barn burner too. What a skills event. But it was just about the like the, the whole like racket in terms of Uber All that being able for to- for $150, like to, oh my goodness. It sounded like, it sounded like you were describing the movie Man on Fire with the drop off. Like I thought he was going to pull up with Ryder <laughs> in the back seat with a- I will give you his her risk life up. for your life. <laughs> Her life, <laughs> you're you're like ready to sacrifice Grinnell to get your fucking iPhone. I, I chucked back, him in the back. Is, I'm like, you hey, could sell him for big money. Which a hey, which the 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 like the, the the cherry on top of it all. You didn't even talk about the fact that the night before you had dropped a water bottle on your bra- brand new MacBook, yep. and yep. and then now that's kaputs. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. I dropped talk, the water on my. So Fort Fort Lauderdale put your ball bag in an absolute vice. My computer was broken. My house is falling apart. I had no phone, and my wife hates me. Have a week. Jesus, <laughs> fucking Tim Jackman part two over here. Florida playing the role. Is he got Tim Jackman, Jackman. exactly. Jesus. But without that, without that wonderful waitress Audri- Adriana, I mean, I can't thank her enough. Just a great person, looking to help out others, and then not even wanting to accept the money I was offered. Thank you. Without her, I do not have my phone back. Maybe people don't care about this story. It was kind of a had to be there. But in the end, like, it's a night I'll never forget. Once again, the wit dog with another hell of a story from the road, losing his phone in Uber.
Only R. R. do that. If you could yeah. see him running around that restaurant asking for someone to translate for him for Spanish, it was top five funniest moments of my life. I, I mean, I get frazzled off and it's funny, but when Wit gets frazzled, that's a different le- level of frazzle. So hilarious stuff from the Wit dog. Next up, this interview, we flew down to Atlanta just for this guy, Charles Barkley. Uh, amazing interview. Hell of a guy. Great chat. I uh, talked about hockey biz, the dream team. We talked to him for an hour and I think a half. We probably could have done three hours. Hopefully I, we'll I, get him again. I think you gave him a few pointers on jump shots too, right, R.A.? Uh, yeah, I might not have done that. Maybe rebounded a little bit. But it was a thrill, especially for an 80s uh, hoops guy like myself. I watched his whole career. I know you know everybody kind of knows him through TV more, more or less these days. But to be, be in the same room with Charles Barkley, a guy who I watched at the Boston Garden across the street 30 years ago, it was quite a treat. So let's send it over to Chuck right now. In a stellar 16-year career, this forward's list of accomplishments is something else. All-rookie team, 11-time All-Star, 11-time All-NBA, All-Star Game MVP, League MVP, 75th 75th anniversary team, and of course, the Basketball Hall of Fame. It's a huge pleasure and a great honor to welcome my dad's favorite non-Celtic to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Charles Barkley. How the hell are you, brother? Man, I'm doing good. I'm really honored <laughs> to to be on the podcast. You know, me and Biz have been together a long time. <laughs> and I and uh he's so much fun on our broadcast. And you know what's crazy about this whole thing? We 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 bought hockey in the last year. I'm surprised they could afford it with your contract now. <laughs> Biz oh, no, 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 no. I, that, you know, my contract came free, later. Right? My contract came later. <laughs> Uh, so no, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, it was so funny. Uh, when they called, they said, "Hey, we need a favor." I'm like, "What you need?" They're like, "We need you to talk Wayne Gretzky into doing television." I'm like, "Does Wayne Gretzky want to do television?" <laughs> They're like, "No, you got to talk him into it." We just <laughs> we just spent like five hundred million dollars. I'm like, <laughs> "Okay," and I was like, "Wayne, I, can I come over and talk to you?" Yeah, yeah. sure. And obviously. When you go to Wayne's house, we're going to do some drinking. I said, Wayne, you need to think, what do you think about television? He's like, I haven't thought about television. I said, well, I need you to do me a favor. Go meet with TNT. And, and then talk calls me. And I, he says, what about me? I says, okay. <laughs> and then Biz comes in. And, man, it's, it's been a lot of fun watching these guys. Because I'm a big, I'm going to watch anyway. And then I was so excited. Because actually was really funny. I tried to get us to buy hockey like, probably 10 years ago. And our boss like, nobody's watching hockey. I said, you don't understand. I said, they don't watch hockey during the regular season, but everybody watched the Stanley Cup playoffs. Yes. And then they went to some shit network like the Outdoor Channel, if I remember correctly. <laughs> we, we were OLN at one point. Yes. <laughs> so I was like, yo, man, I'm rich and got cable and I can't find OLN. <laughs> so I was like, who the hell? What the hell is... Wow. Yeah. And so I was so glad when, you know, you finally they start getting all these great televisions. You can fucking just push a button and say, hey, OLN. I, I like, <laughs> like, so it you was like bull hunting. Yes, yes. yes. I was like, I'm trying to watch Power Play the, here. Uh, I said, it, but it was so funny. So I'm actually really excited that we got hockey, man. It, it's been awesome. That was one of my questions because, I mean, this year you even said coming back from uh, halftime to the to your show, you said, "I'm this game's boring. I'm watching the hockey game. But when did you get into it? Was it when you got drafted by the 76ers and the Flyers? Like, what was your beginning to hockey and enjoying it? It was crazy. It was the Flyers. You know, when I went there with those guys, and, and I tell you, one of the worst days of our lives when Petty Lindbergh oh. got killed in that car accident. And uh, it was brutal. But And I tell you, my two favorite Philadelphia athletes of all time, I got on my wall, Ron Hextall and Brian Dawkins. Uh, I got signed jerseys by both of those guys. So the Hextall years, that, that was it. You know, the Lindros years. Yep. Uh, and that's when I first met Rick Tockett. Uh, so I've been with Tockett since the 80s. Uh, he had but, the flow going then, though. Uh, uh, oh, he, yeah. he, but, you, but you know what's so funny? He's always been just a great dude. Yeah. You know, so you you kind of con- lose contact when you get traded. And next time I see him, it's doing the Stanley Cup Finals. He's actually coaching in Pittsburgh. And, uh, and then next thing I know, he's coaching in Arizona. And uh, I'm glad of his success because he's a really good dude. And then I, I got to know Wayne through the years and Chelios. 
Uh, you know, I know Brett Hull a little bit, but Chelios and Wayne and Talk, man, I see and talk to those guys quite a bit. The dream team and it was at ninety two yep. in Barcelona. Yeah. yeah. It was Bird was on there. Yes. So you got to play with all these legends. That must have been the one of the coolest things about your entire career, right? I'll say this. It was the most intense thing that I've ever been through in my life. Huh. Just because of the amount of pressure to win? No, not the pressure to win. Just playing against these guys every single day in practice. The egos the fun egos, because we got along great. But at that time, you had me and Carl Malone were the two best power forwards. We had to practice against each other every day. You had Michael and Clyde Drexler who hated each other because they had just beaten them in the finals. And Clyde thought he was as good as Michael, and Michael hated him. Uh, Ashley, and you had Magic, who had just gotten locked down by Scottie Pippen in the finals. So he was pissed. And you had David Robinson and Patrick Ewing, who were the two best centers in the NBA, <laughs> and playing against the guy considered your rival every day. Is, uh, and people have said, uh, many people have said, they've never seen anything as intense and fun and thrilling as watching the Dream Team actually practice. It was crazy and exciting. The crazy thing about it, we all got along so well, but when we went on the court, man, it's probably the most intense thing. Uh, you know, playing against a guy like Carl, like every day, like, okay, they said, lot, most people think I'm the best power forward and some people think you are. Now we get to prove it on the court every day. And like I say, Scott against Magic, Clyde against Michael, and then David against Patrick. Did, did, did that spark it? Was it was it more of the Michael thing that that sparked it, and like the whole group got invested in it, or was it literally man to man where every guy was looking across the room like, "Yeah, I'm going uh, to war." It was with this more man to man, and these were close practices, right? So it's just yeah. nobody. It's Any not fist, video. Yeah. Any it's fist fights? No. Your pride. Any fist fights? No fist fight. No. No. What the thing that was crazy? I couldn't believe how long well we all got along. I mean, it was crazy how well we got along. I mean. It, you know, they we made a t-shirt because Larry Bird and Patrick Ewan became Harry and Larry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we made a t-shirt. <laughs> and you know, me, Magic, Michael, and Scotty, we gambled every night from probably eight o'clock in the morning <laughs> to four o'clock every single day. I mean, blackjack? No, uh, uh Tunk. Huh? I don't even know what that is. Wow. It's uh white folks call it gin run gin. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it, man, we and like I say, man, it would be thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars changing hands every night. Oh it was my crazy. god! It was crazy. And then we would finish up about four in the morning, so we can go get like two hour nap. It was, I mean, it was so much fun. Like how, we, how would you guys compete at such a high level, but yet be such degenerates off the court? Like that's like that's not treating it very professionally. Like guys nowadays don't do that. They don't even drink. Well, you, you guys well, are boozing, well, it, gambling all hours in the night. Like, how was your stress level going into practice? The, the, the basketball was the fun part of it. <laughs> I mean, because, well, because I'll tell you what was crazy. There's this infamous practice and Grant Hill's full of shit <laughs> and those guys. So we played against a, a group. The first day we played against a bunch of college all-stars. And I think it's probably eight of those guys who went on to go to the Hall of Fame. But we're all probably all... 30, if I remember correctly then. We played this group of all-star. Bobby Hurley was there, and we could not guard his little ass in the beginning. But Magic wasn't a great defender. He couldn't keep him in front of him. So we started scrimmaging. And before we know it, we're down like 20. Chuck calls a timeout. And we're just actually just screwing around. They're all like 17 years old, 18 years old, and we're just joking around. And they're playing like it's game seven. And before we know it, we're down like 20 points and we're still screwing around. And Chuck says, Chuck calls timeout says, you guys know if y'all fucking lose this gold medal, it's going to be the biggest upset in sports history. Like, what? You guys out here jacking around. These college kids kicking your ass. The other team, the foreign team's much better than these guys. And, you know, if you guys come out here jacking around, it's going to be hell to pay for the representing your, your country. And we're like, Okay, guys, let's turn it up a notch and kick these dudes. So we scored like 18 straight points to get to two, and Chuck calls to say, game over. We're like, what? No, 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 no. <laughs> He's like, I said game over. <laughs> and his point was, guys, you don't understand. You're representing your country. You got the greatest team ever assembled. But if y'all fucking lose, 
it's going to be an international deal. And from that point on, we started taking things really, really serious. So no drinking and gambling the rest of the trip? No, no, no. We go. Oh, <laughs> no, God, no. Come on, my God. Come on man. You, know, <laughs> you, you crazy, bitch? <laughs> hey, you know, you know, I was reading the other day that well, drinking is really, really bad for you. Yeah. So I quit. <laughs> uh, I quit reading. Uh, <laughs> 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 oh, shit. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You're fucking, you're out of your mind. No, no, no. The guy told me a couple good ones the other day. He says, uh, he said he was talking to his wife and he says, baby, I was looking in the mirror and I got a gut. I got wrinkles. My titties are hanging down. <laughs> what do you think? He says, well, your eyes work. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh, shit. Oh my God. You know, hanging with your crazy friends are the best thing about playing sports. No, There's no. nothing like it. But once we said, okay, let's get this thing done. And it was so crazy because we didn't realize how big we were going to be. When you got older. Like there. as far as the oh, media yeah. circus? No, but, well, not the fans. So, because we, we started out at Torrey Pines. We went to Monte Carlo for a week to practice. I forget what other country we went to, but we just went, they just wanted to make it fun for us. So we get to Barcelona. And at our hotel, you couldn't get close to our hotel. The security was so tight. Man, it was 5,000 people out there watching us get on and off the bus every day. It was crazy. It felt like the Beatles. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, they were probably 50 yards away, and they could only see you for like five to 10 seconds walking. And every time, obviously, Magic, Michael, and Bird were the three biggest stars. But it was three to 5,000 people out there every single day just watching when we go to practice in the morning, when we go to the game. And then driving to the game, they had a police car in front, they had a police car in back. On the side of the bus, each side, they had a, a, a guy, two guys on motorcycles. One guy driving a motorcycle and one guy with a machine gun. And they had a helicopter above the bus. And then along the highway, there were at least 500, couple hundred people to up to 500 every time we went to the game because it was different going to practice. People just holding up signs, standing on the side of the highway. And we're like, whoa, this is a big deal. Because like I say, you don't know what to expect going in. But then we're like, yo, man, there's 5,000 people waiting outside our hotel just to get a glimpse of, glimpse of us. And we're like, oh. And then, like I say, uh, just standing on the side of the highway holding up signs. And then I remember after we said, like, God, this is a really big deal. And then the game started. And we're like, even though we're winning games like 50, 60, 70, 80 points, they're like, Number one watched event in Olympic history. Like, people watching us and Chuck's like, guys, look at these ratings. We're shouting everybody ever watched the Olympics record. And, we're, and like I say, we're winning by 50, 60, 70 points some of these games. And people over here are still watching. And then we're like, guys, we need to start taking this thing really serious. And from that point on, we just like, we're just going to kill everybody. Because like I said, we did not know going in that we were going to win every game by that many points, to be honest with you. We knew we were going to win more than likely. And I think the closest game we ever came was probably 45, 50 points. Yeah, and still that much interest. But like you talk about the salaries now, and, and, and part of it is just how big internationally the NBA is. Like that was the beginning of it, right? That was it. But David Stern, who was the best ever commissioner in sports, he admitted later that was really his game plan. He says, because through Nike, we had did a couple things in foreign countries. I'd been to J China, Japan, Germany, things like that. But that was just like me and a couple of Nike guys. But David Stern admitted later the reason he wanted to send pros to the Olympics was to make the game international. And I've had so many young guys say, hey, my first recollection of basketball in yeah. my country was the dream team. That's awesome. Yeah. I got, well, just one last one, the dream team. Now, obviously, Leighton was on the team. Famously, Isaiah Thomas wasn't. Was that strictly because MJ didn't want him there and that, and that, that was it? Because, I mean, it's 
Chuck Daly was his own coach with the Pistons, and he still wasn't on the team. Yeah, you know what's so crazy about that? That's been a controversy for since 92. And I've said publicly, they never ask us about me personally, about Isaiah. And then Michael, I guess, had lied for 100 years, <laughs> saying um, he had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and then the tape came out. Says, well, they got Michael on tape saying he, would, he wouldn't play if Isaiah's on the team. So I guess it's true. But I've, I've always told Isaiah this, because I like Isaiah. The, they never ask, I, and I, I can't speak for other players, to be honest with you. I don't know who they asked. They didn't ask me. But uh, it, 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 I guess Michael didn't want him on the team, plain and simple. Was, uh, was there any poopy pants of guys? Because, like, obviously playing time is so different. Were there any guys that, like, they were pissed they weren't playing enough? Or was it such a close-knit group? People were cool with not getting the minutes they usually get. You, you, you know, that's a great question because I have two stories. Because I actually played on the first two dream teams. So on the first dream team, Chuck had two starting units. And he says, you guys going to play the first 10. You guys going to play the second 10. And we didn't care uh, about Leitner, to be honest with you. Like, okay. Yeah, call. It doesn't yeah, count. Yeah, yeah. He said, one well, you guys ain't going to play a lot one game. And we're like, we're cool. We're cool. Four years later, I wasn't going to play again, to be honest with you. In Atlanta, right? In Atlanta, because it was such a great experience. I says, hey, man, because I tell people this. Ain't nothing like the Olympics. If you like sports, everybody should go to the Olympics one time in their life. It's the coolest thing. Television does not do it justice. Everybody should go to the Olympics one time in their life as a fan. It's unbelievable. So I said, well, I'm not going to play because I want somebody's experience. And then Leonard Wilkins called me. He says, no, we got a bunch of young guys. I don't know how they're going to be. I need to bring you in. I says, okay, you know what? I said, because... Number one, family and friends couldn't go to Barcelona. My hometown is an hour and a half from here. I'm like, okay, that'll be cool. My mom and everybody can come, blah, 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 blah. And it was a fucking nightmare. <laughs> it was a fucking nightmare. <laughs> was it cutting into your gambling? No, 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 no. <laughs> you beat your babysitter. Guy, guy, like, guys like, I'm not getting to play. Why am I not starting? We had a couple, of, and I was like, Carl Malone didn't start last time. I, I was like, wait a minute. I played with fucking the best players that ever played this game. Nobody complained. And you guys are, and you're not even that fucking good. <laughs> and y'all complain about starting. You're complaining about playing time. And so it really bothered me and pissed me off. I says, guys, I played on the greatest team ever assembled. Nobody ever said a thing about starting. Nobody complained about playing time. You represent your fucking country in your country. Yeah. Because 90 percent of the time, 99 percent of the time when you go to the Olympics, you're playing in another country and you can't have a bunch of family and friends there because they can't afford to go there. They, I say everybody can fly to Atlanta. You represent your country. You probably got all your family and friends here. This is going to be a great experience. You're going to get to fucking get on that metal stand and and you guys are complaining about who's playing and who's not. You're not getting enough minutes and you ain't starting. So. That was a great question you asked, but it, 92 was not a lot of fun. Now, excuse me, 96 was not a lot of fun. 92 was amazing. Man, awesome stuff from Bakley. Again, if you haven't checked out that whole interview, definitely do it. Hilarious, uh, introspective, all kinds of stuff with Giles Bakley. It was awesome. Uh, next up, we were very lucky to talk to Jonathan Machiso, Hunt's my trophy winner right after the Stanley Cup. And of course, you can never go wrong with a Phil Kessel story. So send it over to Machi for one of those. You bring up Phil and... It's a pretty incredible story. I mean, he, he breaks the all-time Ironman record. He plays every game this year, and then he, he wasn't a part of, uh, of the playoff team and, and, and what you guys did. But as hard as that was for him, how great was he around the room? I'm sure he was still very professional, and like that must have been hard for him to watch have happen. But, but for you guys to see him stay positive must have meant a lot. Yeah, I mean, he, he's... Like he has to be one of the best teammates I played with. Like he That's is unbelievable. He is unbelievable. And you know what? Like he's an Hall of Famer. Like I don't like the numbers are what they are, right? He is an unbelievable guy to play with. He, but like even is is, I don't even mind what he does on the ice. Like it, that's remarkable already. Just the fact that he's a character. Like he, the way he speaks, the way he says things, like his uh, expressions about everything, like. Now everybody talks like him on the team. Like all the expressions, like we all talk the same way as him. And like, 
he comes to us at me and Jack most of the, and Stevie. Like we're always around him, like chewing his chewing his ear a little bit, like fucking around with him. And like you have to stop saying my lines here, eh? That's when I'm gone. You guys have to stop <laughs> saying my lines. And it's just like all of those things like that. That is, I don't know. He, he was unbelievable. And yeah, he wasn't in, in the lineup the past few games, but he was the same. Like he was the same. And uh, he's so funny. Like he comes in before game five, the practice day. And he's like, if you fucking guys lose the game <laughs> and I have to fucking fly to Florida and back, I'm going to be pissed. <laughs> like always stuff like that that is just every day like we just sit around him and wait for him to say something stupid and yeah. we let each other all laughing it was <laughs> it was so much fun to just be around the guy this the that guy this year bruce cassidy comes in, he's like hold up here i gotta say something quickly before you go bruce if you guys make me fly across the country i'm gonna <laughs> fucking wring out your necks all right go yeah, ahead bruce. It, oh. yeah, it was it was funny but like this guy's equipment is terrible like he has stuff that he had for 15 years and it's like we're like making fun of this so we're kind of making fun of a little bit of everything and like the whole character and after like the coaches start after every, every video say something about phil and he was not so happy about it, but it was just hilarious to see his reaction and stuff like that. So it was unbelievable. Jonathan, we were just talking about what Jack uh, brought to the ice. What did Butch, as a new coach, uh, bring behind the bench for you guys? Well, he came in and, like, it was, like, every culture different. Like, obviously, Butch is a little bit, of bo- a little bit more of a motherfucking behind the bench than the other ones oh, we had. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Every time <laughs> the fucking camera pans to him, if you made oh, the mistake. Oh, He's you motherfucker. you. Oh, geez. Kidnap well, your family. Every start of the game, like the first shift, if somebody turns the puck over, he's losing. Like we're like we're, we didn't even do a shift yet. He's motherfucking the guys on the ice, and I'm we. Everybody's like, okay, let's relax. We're all okay here. Like we're just starting the game, and but he always message was like, one of his messages that got to me more is like, let's get to our game. Let's get to our game. So that's why he was probably mad at first, like because we're fucking around on the ice. But uh, in the playoff, like you didn't hear it. Like, he was not, like, uh, mad about turnovers and stuff like that. He was more, like, neutral, and I think that, that helped us being really calm on the uh, uh, on the bench. And the belief on our group was was there. Like, we, we knew we were in every game. So, uh, yeah, but his message was, like, he, he had a couple of good messages. That, that was, like, get to your game. Like, we're the better team. Like, you know what? Like, he was adjusting every game something. So like it's it, it, he was playing chess, you know, like he was always uh, adjusting something. So I think, I think that's something that made us better, uh, definitely, and we needed in the past few years. Watching Stone and, and and just like you know he's had such a long career, he's just such a great all around player. We we joke sometimes that he skates like Biz, but I mean, <laughs> this year and ha- he as does. he's gone through as he's gone through these back surgeries, and then he's you know he's missing the regular season in the second half. Are you, are, are you guys worried? Like, is he not going to be able to come back? Was he open and adamant to you guys? Like, I'll be ready to go once playoff starts. Like, what was his year like for you guys being around him, trying to battle through a second back surgery? Yeah, I mean, that was so unfortunate, to be honest. Yeah. Like, you think you do a surgery and you're done with it, right? You Like, you just do recovery and you're okay to come back. Like, that was it was sad to see him, to be honest. Like, when he got injured this year, uh, right after, he's like, all right, guys, uh, he texted on the group, like, guys like i'm doing the the same surgery again uh my timeline is should be coming back for first round i'm gonna battle for you guys to come back first round and you know i won't be around on uh, around the team as much because he doesn't come on the road and stuff but like i'm just so you know i'm gonna battle back and i'll be back for you guys for playoffs so just good luck the rest of the year and see you in playoffs kind of thing and man he was like he was out at the rink like for three, four hours, four or five hours sometimes, and just grinding in the gym, doing all ex- his exercise. And he, he was like, you can tell you wanted to come back for us. And honestly, it's when that's that's your captain, that's your leader that battles like that. It just goes down through the lineup. And I, I mean, that's that definitely gave us a little boost knowing that he was going to come back. He looks like a different guy without the the mustache, huh? I seen him just clean shave. You can't even recognize. Yeah, him. He, he looks young for sure. But I like you. Would, you would see this guy in practice, and you're like, "Oh my god!" Like, he, like he's not the flashiest guy, right? In practice, like 
shoots almost from the always from the between the blue and the top of the circle like doesn't score much in practice but he gets in the game and just holy is a different player he's an elite player in the league and I mean he's he's unbelievable and like I've played like with a lot of guys in my life but like rarely is one guy makes everybody good on the ice like he could play with anyone in the league he would somehow make that guy a special hockey player and that's probably the the best quality to have we haven't even talked about the the revolving door in net yet even throughout the season but that in in, in playoffs with uh with Brassois going down and then Hill coming in yeah I mean well this year our, the main guy I thought was uh Logan for a bit uh Thompson he was great he was playing great he got a nasty injury Trey came back too early got it hurt again and after Hill was doing good but he was like not playing as often as Thompson but he was really doing good too and after Brossois was in the in the AHL for the most part of the se- of the season and after we were ev- all our goalies were injured so we went to get quickie and like we were se- we were at the end of the season and we were like who's our goalie here like, who- <laughs> who's starting and and, and it, it honestly didn't matter to us because we we believe that the team in front of them was really good and any of them would have done the job. I think like they, everybody was great and LB came in and he was like, by the end of the season, he was like unbelievable. So we're like, well, we got to start LB. He was the best goalie in the past two, three weeks. So they started him and after he went down and Hiller was coming back from his injury, I think he went down and Silver and I played one game. And after he comes down, he comes against the Oilers and started being like lights out. He did an unbelievable run. Like the save that he made, that he made along the series were unbelievable, giving us a chance every night. And you know what? Like sometimes we weren't really, one of our weaknesses as a team is our starts in the first period. Like we weren't really good some, most of the time. And he made some key save right off the bat. And uh, yeah, he, our goalies were unbelievable, but Hiller's run at the end was 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 sick for sure to be part of. Just great stuff from Machi and Zach too that day. Uh, such an honor to have those guys on the show right after they won the cup. So uh, next up, uh, this guy, when we found out we were getting him on the show, we were over the moon and he did not disappoint. Peter Forsberg, Foppa, as he's known. Uh, tremendous stories. And the one about his injury was uh, incredible. So take it away, Foppa. Our next interview is brought to you by Chevy. Chevy is working to make charging simple. Over 110,000 charging stations across the U.S. and Canada and growing. My Chevy app. Your smartphone becomes your co-pilot when using the My Chevrolet mobile app with Energy Assist. The app allows you to access vehicle information like battery status and charging settings from anywhere. The Energy Assist feature intelligently plans your routes, tells you where and how long to charge up, and gives you real-time data about charging station availability. Home charging, three different levels available. Chevy electric vehicles offer great options for charging. All of them as simple as plugging in your smartphone. Learn more at chevy.com slash electric. After you guys did did get that cup, I mean, the next few years, a couple losses to Detroit and Dallas, but then Ray Bork's on the team for his full se- first full season there. You get Rob Blake, and you guys end up going on to win. But for you, you played with a... Was it your spleen and you didn't even know it was ruptured in game seven of the second round? Like, how did you figure out that was the issue? Was it even in question of you playing in a couple of those games when you did get injured? How did that all happen? I don't think I knew before. Uh, after game seven, we got knocked out uh, L.A., I think, in game seven at home. I was just at the restaurant and all suddenly it was starting to hurt, especially the whole left side. Um, and then uh, I called the trainer and the trainer said well, the worst thing it could ever be is you ruptured oh. your spleen. I'm like, okay. But then you walk, you go into the hospital and you walk in, I'm like, ah, oh, maybe it's not that bad. <laughs> you just get out of here. And then like an hour later, it's like 1.7 liters of blood in your, in your, uh, your oh. body there. And then you yeah. almost died. So it went pretty fast, I would say, but <clears throat> nothing that I knew in the game that I was going to, that it hurt. She started bothering me maybe an hour and a half after the game. Uh, I don't know why, but that I guess it was maybe it was just a tiny opening before that, and then the, totally the floodgates opened there right after the game. But but the, I was lucky. I remember asking the the doctor there. You know, they're like, "You're gonna? Am I gonna survive? Yeah, you're gonna be fine. You're gonna live a normal life afterwards." And the next question, like, "Can I play anymore in the playoffs?" He said, "No." And then 
got a little sad. I didn't really care about the surgery. I just was sad that I couldn't play anything in the rest of the playoffs. But but everything went fine. I had the best doctors, and I'm, right now I'm fine. And I think that leads into one of the most legendary stories, which is the following year. And with all the injuries you kind of accumulated throughout that season, you took the whole regular season off, followed by leading the playoffs and scoring. So when did the team decide that you were just going to be shut down for that whole regular season? No, that was my own because I had such a problem with my feet and the bursa sacks and they were hurting so bad. And then I think it was also a combination, lost the spleen and almost died. And I was like, uh, I did the surgery on my foot that year and took away the bursa sacks because I barely got them in the skates. And then they came back for the, you know, when I start practicing for the, for the, for the camp. And I'm like, I can't go through another year hurting so much in my feet. And then, then the spleen and everything. I think I was, I don't think I was ready. So uh, I decided just to tell the team, like, don't pay me. I used to go home and I'm going to come back when I'm ready. And then I came back in, in January and, and I had an infection from the surgery there and they kind of ate up my tendon. So I had to do, as soon as I got back to Denver, I had to have a surgery on my tendon there for the Jeez. rest of the year. So that's why I missed all 11 months. Um, <clears throat> so, and it was really close i would say not making the playoffs too but i had i remember it's kind of funny i had one two on one as a as a on only contact drill before they throw me in the playoffs and they're like here you go you can start playing i'm like okay let's get it going and i got thrown in first game against la and, and i guess it worked out i was in good shape i had worked out for for 10 months straight so i was in good shape okay so b- despite the injury and the bursa sack stuff you were still able to like keep your conditioning up and uh, i was going to ask like y- did you offer not to be paid did they still end up paying you given everything you had done for the organization okay sounds good pete <laughs> yeah <laughs> no I-, I said i don't pay me i just want to take my time because uh, you know i did the bursa sex that's such a problem he's hurting every single day you know when i put practices i'm like I have to take my time. You can't, you know, force me. So I, and, and, and I want to be under any pressure. Uh, it's just don't pay me. <laughs> just, stupidly, the worst thing, it was my highest year of pain too. So it was oh. bad timing for me personally, but uh, I guess uh, <clears throat> then my economy studies didn't work out for that one. But <laughs> <laughs> Please hey, I well, to take my time. <laughs> hey, well, good, good thing that the, the Crocs thing ended up working out. Um, and I, I kind of want to throw it over you because I don't want to spoil it, but you were an early investor into Crocs, the silly shoes that guys wear around in the locker room. And I guess they're, every they're, nurse wears in every hospital in the yeah. world. <laughs> I think it was more like a boating shoe. I think that's what yeah. I heard when they came up. And there was a couple of friends from Boulder that was uh in very really in early investors in that and then they said oh if we're going to make it if it booms here everywhere in the in the united states you're going to help us out in scandinavia and that's what happened because i had the foot problems and i had the foot guy that took care of me and he had a couple of stores i'm like could you help me with this we started crocs and yeah we made a budget selling maybe five thousand shoes and then i'm selling about half a million <laughs> the next year so <laughs> it was kind of funny the, how it ended up and, and that's how it, we got into shoes and that's why we're still in shoes too with the crocs so so this was just a local <laughs> friend of yours and he, and he was from boulder colorado and because yeah. i think when i heard the story he like somebody said that, that the guy brought him into the locker room and put him in the in the, in the dressing room and everybody was looking at him being like, yeah, no. this." What are those? Work. What are those? <laughs> exactly. Well, that, that was before. I think they were white at least when they got yellow and blue and all bad colors. And then they got really ripped in the Swedish media. Like I brought the worst shoes ever to, <laughs> to sell in Sweden. But especially when you mix the blue and the yellow, they look horrible. But yeah, that's kind of his story. This, his name was Tom Duran, actually. He helped us with a few other things. We sold the... Uh, the skate sharpening machine he helped us there too and then we decided to help him out with the crocs selling in scandinavia and it worked out great so you still currently like own the, the rights of like distributing crocs in all of scandinavia no we do that in wiki now we upgraded the shoes are really beautiful nowadays uh, so <laughs> we upgraded <laughs> that's amazing i want to i want to go into the, the the foot issues you mentioned was that the first year they, that those kind of started in that run uh, when you guys won in 01 and you had to miss the time, like when did when did all of the foot issues begin? Did they go back to when you were younger? Uh, I've always been curious as to how that all started. No, it's uh, not, not what had happened. I think it started, uh, not really sure about the year, but I think it was 03. Uh, when my best year then, I played really well in, pre- and in the regular season. And then maybe one game before the playoffs, it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> and so it didn't. So what happens is like the foot doesn't stick in the skate. I lose the balance all the time. So 
but it was more like one one game to another uh the weirdest thing and and uh, maybe a trauma or whatever it was but i had maybe 10 or 12 surgeries afterwards and never got fixed so still have the same problem as today i had some serious foot issues as well one of my surgeons was guy dr anderson in north carolina did you see him for <clears throat> some of yours yeah no he uh he cut my heel off and moved it in and then we decided i actually found out it was not the problem so we cut the heel off again and moved it back so uh <laughs> jesus kind of it's just a oh that was a painful surgery too like yeah so uh that we i tried i tried him too we tried that too uh it's not only his idea i wanted to do it just didn't want to do it like really permanent that would hurt me for the rest of my life just walking and doing things so tried a different few things but uh, i guess uh, <clears throat> nope nothing worked so you're not in pain walking or anything it's just in terms nope. of skating i would say in terms of skating uh Somehow it just um, I lose the balance and I can for a while I almost can tie it up and then I can twist and turn and maybe almost lift the foot out of the skate. It was the weirdest thing. I can make a could almost pull it in to you know go from a size for eight to a size six with it and and uh, so so that's why I didn't really stick in the skate because then all of a sudden I got you know I had a lot of room in the, in, in the boot. So uh, <clears throat> but. Uh, I'm 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 okay with it now. I, I have to say it was a few few frustrating year. Uh, so many surgeries, so many weird things going on there. So uh, I, I guess it didn't have, didn't work. Even to the yeah. point where didn't they have like a like a electricity pack? Yeah. And they had, to, they yeah. had to like build it into your skate. And like, what was the purpose of that? Was it to try to distract the pain? No, not to distract the pain. It was more like the like I said, I could shrink the foot, but if they had the electrical if the, the muscle was on all the time, it, I couldn't shrink the foot. So that's why I had it on. So, uh, so the muscle would be, I would not want to call it like totally <clears throat> back in the electrical work. And uh, you can see, I didn't work <laughs> at the electrical <laughs> either, but it was, it was, it made the, the, the muscle like, uh, whatever strain the whole time, like hard all the time. So I, I couldn't move the foot. That's kind of the reason uh why i used that one uh, i tried so many things believe me i i tried every little thing that you could possibly do i try to <clears throat> put it in a cast uh, i i tried i would say everything in that foot four thousand things but nothing worked and honestly I, I know what you mean i was doing the same exact thing and i think i just it's so exhausting to keep having to try things and then they don't work for me. At least I was just like, this is mentally crushing me more than physically in a way. Wow. Well, yeah. I, I, it was a, always a battle. You know, I try to keep yeah. the skates cold because the harder that it were, they were easy to skate. But, but I would say that the hardest part was, I knew the left foot and I knew how I could play and I knew when I was good and some games and I'm like, this is going to be tough. And, you know, uh, you're going to go in the sold out building. You're going to get the uh, hatcher chasing you, try to kill you. And then it's like, oh, I can't even hold my balance. So to be honest, the, the last couple of years, kind of first surviving the first two first periods, and then it was close. And then, and then you, you, you get going in the last because then nobody had the time to chase you down. And, uh, you know, I even retired in the game in Philly. You know, I said, this is it. I can't skate. I can't do anything about this. I hate it. We had a meeting after first period. Me and Gagne and uh, Stevens was the coach. I'm like, I'm retiring. I can't, I can't move. Come on. And then um, I tipped one in and I had an assist. We beat Pittsburgh 3-2. I'm like, I think I got first or second star. I'm like, I can't retire. <laughs> this is not work. So it was kind of back and forth struggling. But I would say the hardest part is like, you knew you couldn't do the best out there, even for your teammates. And then people in the stands watching and like, oh, try to, you know, play harder, play tougher, but I, I just couldn't. You couldn't keep the balance. When you guys uh, moved over, right, that that your second season, well, you get Claude Lemieux, and he just won the Stanley Cup in Jersey. What's your first uh, memories of meeting him in training camp? And I believe it, during your cup run that season, you guys played on the same line, right? Occasionally. He got suspended a few games, but most of the games <laughs> we <have> played together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no. No, for sure. Uh, he was uh, – we knew – I knew he played really well, and but I also knew he was uh, – and known for a few few dirty shots. So I'm like, oh, this if we're gonna play with this guy, people's gonna try to run us and murder us every game here. I don't know if that's gonna work out, but I, you know, he he um, he was uh, he was a fierce competitive. I would say he he left everything on the ice every single night. Night, so uh, 
and and he also de- de- demanded on that you played well and played good every single game. So uh, no, I was enjoyed playing with him. He was not uh, shy to put his nose in front of net and put the pucks in. And and when I think back, you're like, yeah, I don't think I knew anybody that cheered more than him when he scored. Like he was really happy when he scored. <laughs> That's a funny thing. Yeah, can't think of Claude without thinking of the Detroit Red Wings. Were you ever part of a rivalry that had that much hatred to it, Peter? No, no, that's uh, never been part of anything like that ever before or after. That was yeah, him uh, and his summer was, job, all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two, okay. three years there was tough. Uh, it was tough for me. I mean, they had six or seven Swedes and they were running around like, I remember getting on the flight 98. I was flying with the Detroit guys to, to Nagano. I'm like, hey, guys, <laughs> oh, <laughs> what's no. up? Yeah, and then this is to, yeah. That was very awkward. Yeah, I would say, you know, uh, maybe that's why we lost in the quarters too in the Nagano games. Yeah. Yeah. Cause as big as, as a prick as you were on the ice, I believe you only got in one NHL fight in your entire career and it was Martin LaPointe. I don't know. I don't know if it's really a fight, but yeah, we, 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 we throwed one or two punches, but we didn't drop the gloves. Uh, we, uh, I think we had kept the gloves on. But he hit hard, I would say. I was actually surprised. He hit hard. But I had a, I think in preseason, I fought Avery. Uh, I actually, we both dropped the gloves. And uh, so that's my, I don't, but didn't count on the, on the NHL stats, but, but uh, that one didn't end up for good for me either. I, I think I actually hit him, but then the, my teammates were screaming or everybody screaming, help him. And then I got help from my rest of so my teammates. So. That, that's crazy that that was the one fight you got and it was in preseason. I'm sure that him chirping and, and him getting, uh, him lipping off had something to do with it in order to get under your skin for you to even consider it? Well, it was, uh, yeah, I'm mean, like, we're in Vegas. I'm like, <laughs> come on, leave us. We can just enjoy playing the game and and, and go out after the game. Like, <laughs> why do we have to be so intense in the game? And he was all over. It was kind of a funny story, too, because we're in, I was in the in the hallway there, and one of the defensemen, I said, uh, he's, my, my teammates, he goes, just start with Aver, that will kill him for you. So, I started, but then Laprier jumped uh, my defensive partner. Then I got stuck with Avery. So that's why it em- ended up. That's why I tried to start it with him. But uh, yeah. Like somebody's Avery. supposed to come in. Yeah, yeah. Where's yeah, my yeah, guy? Like, yeah, exactly. Somebody helped me. But then uh, I guess the, somebody yelled from the, from, the, from the bench to help him. And then I got help. So. But uh, he didn't really hit me. So I got away from her scrap with not, a, not a, any blue marks or nothing. The crazy fight night uh, versus Detroit. I mean, the spark plug for that was probably you and Igor Larianov, two un- unlikely guys. I don't think you got a fight major for it, but that was sort of the, the almost the tr- not the trigger for it, but that kind of got the ball rolling a bit that night. Yeah, you know, I don't know why I didn't think about it, but who thought that I was going to wrestling Larianov, and and I didn't have I didn't have a clue either. Larianov played that McCarthy or or Shanahan was going to be on the ice at the same time. I, uh, so. It's just me being in in the game, not thinking about what could happen. There had been so much talks about what was going to happen back and forth, and, and then, uh, no, I didn't think about it. Then we start wrestling, and all of a sudden, you, when the wrestler game is over, it's like, <laughs> what's going on here? I'm like, oops, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Claude. <laughs> Didn't think about it. Uh, after your first Stanley Cup win, what did you do with your, your day with the Cup? Did you have it over in Sweden? What was uh, what was the day of, all about? Yeah, it was kind of so-so when I got the Cup because we had the World Cup. <clears throat> we went so, you know, the game was, the last game uh, in Florida was in June sometime, and then we had the World Cup. And I was got to celebrate it. Then two days later, we had Germany in the World Cup. Uh, so uh, kind of a bad timing to get the Cup, I would say. Um because you don't want to be, uh, you actually want to be behaving when you play against Germany. You know? <laughs> Try to be able to back check a little bit at least. So it's kind of a quiet night with the cup. Was that easily the most grueling experience of your career, like going through four rounds like that? Because I know the year before you said you guys got bounced in the first round when you were in Quebec. Like, had anything was 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 there anything that could could have prepared you for that run? No, it was a <clears throat> that was a tough run. I, I think uh, we also stayed in the hotel the whole way, and it just felt like a. Ooh, felt like eight months, those two months you you, you went through all that. But but I would say uh, we didn't think about that. You know, me and I remember me and Deadmarsh looked at the Claude brought the, the ring there one one uh, pretty early and when we ate there before in the playoffs and you're like, we want that thing. Like we're gonna we, we don't think about anything. We're gonna have the we want that ring, we want the cup and 
And the first year, I would say uh, it's all happiness, even if you stay in the hotel. I would say the next year when you got in the room and, and, and stayed another month and a half, and it's like, oh, a little long. But the first year, I would say it was just a, uh, you had one goal, and this was to win the cup. I got to ask about, um, you know, 1994, the Olympics. You became this international hockey legend with the, with the shootout winner. But leading up to that, you mentioned Naslin and how close you guys were. He actually went over to North America that 93, 94 season. So he didn't get to play on that team and, and you stayed back. Was, was that like hard for you guys that he, was he just ready to make the jump? And, and he probably knew that meant he wasn't going to be on that Olympic team with you, right? No, he was ready. He was uh, much more mat- mature when we were that age. So he was ready to go over. He, uh, I would say dominated uh, in practices in the league when he left. So I don't think I was uh I wasn't that good, I would say. People say probably say I was okay, but but he was he was ready to take the step and and um, yeah, I don't know if it's only the Olympics. I stayed home. I would say it helped out. That was uh, that that came up that year um, in '94. Um, and but but uh, yeah, it just uh, to be honest, it was more like I didn't want to leave my hometown. I wanted the Swedish meatballs for another year. Which just mentioned the 94 Olympics, of course, the goal against uh, Corey Hirsch to steal the gold medal. Had you ever tried that move in a game before? Was that the first time you dusted it off for, for a game? No, I, I tried it in the in the Swedish league uh, a couple of months earlier. Of course, I missed. <laughs> but, that takes a but, big set of yeah, balls to so then pull it out in the gold medal game. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It didn't work last time, so I'm going to pull it out when <laughs> absolutely when it counts, but... I was just a horrible uh, penalty shooter back then, and I couldn't do any other move. I had like two, five hole on that one. And, and uh, yeah, I guess it couldn't work out any better than it did. Was that the first time where maybe you, you'd gone around Sweden and you were getting noticed by people? Like, did your did your fame significantly rise after that goal? Uh, a little bit. Um, but I won, you know, I won the world championship two years earlier when I was when I was 18, and then I... And I mean, Marcus was running around in the Swedish League there in '93, and and made some headlines. And uh, no, I think, yeah, it helped out. But if you, I guess, if you knew hockey, I think you kind of knew who I was before that. And then nice. after that too, we ended up in the Swedish final there, and I kind of embarrassed myself after the loss in the final. Actually said, I actually said that I was going to beat up the referee after the, <laughs> after we lost the finally. I was going to punch him, so it didn't really help out either uh, to stay in, uh, incognito there in Sweden after that. Did you get fined for that one? Did, did they did they come down with a with a hard penalty? No, I got no fine. I got nothing for it. Uh, no, but I don't know. I think they blamed the camera guy or the interview guy that you know showed up with a mic 30 seconds after the game so yeah nobody really nobody really blamed me <laughs> which is good <laughs> they like, still play the audio for 5 minutes yeah. to cool off guys <laughs> exactly <laughs> don't they still play the audio during some games uh, in this current day like the audio from that clip no i don't know if they do it but uh, oh. yeah a few <laughs> few dads of the kids that i you know i have some of my own kids that in sweden they come up and they remember that actually the the clip that was going to beat up uh, try to punch the ref but uh <laughs> I think when you if you look at it, you know, you can see that I had passion for the game at least. Uh, yeah. I think that's what people say when they come up. Eh, I understand them. I, the ref wasn't that bad, but but they, we can see you were pretty crazy after that. They actually liked the win. Just an unreal story. Unreal guy. That was a legit one of our probably top two or three interviews we did this year. We had some some doozy. So thanks again to Peter Forsberg for coming on with us. Uh, it was also a big year for the Game Notes crew. Uh, bringing in Ami and uh, Merle's like we have full time. It's, it's been a treat, especially on the road. Like I, me and Ami get... We really click comedic wise, so it's great to have those guys part of the Chicklets family, and uh, they're the shower sheriffs as well. I mean, if you're in the shower playing beer league or whatever, these guys are gonna tell you how it's done. So let's uh, turn over to the game notes, boys, right now. Hello, Canada. This episode is brought to you by the Scorebet Sportsbook and Casino. The Scorebet is the best sportsbook for the hockey obsessed, with a wide variety of markets and daily specials from us here at Spit and Chicklets. It's got you covered for it everything on the ice. So if you're in Ontario only, download the ScoreBet app and create an account today. You can build and follow your bets directly from the Score Sports app for the best possible experience. With the playoff push coming up, you don't want to miss anything. And the ScoreBet also has you covered for all your other favorite sports and players. Plus, there's tons of iCasino games any day, anytime. That's the ScoreBet. Download today and see how the best sports app, period, does sports betting. 
Please play responsibly. 19 plus. Ontario only. Gambling problem? Call Connex Ontario at 1-866-531-2600. Well, I was talking to a guy the other day. He's from New Jersey. Big spit and chicklets uh, fan bases in New Jersey. I know you're shitty on New Jersey, Biz, but maybe we got to go there and, and see some of these people. Beer league uh, tricks, quirks Etiquette. in the dressing Etiquette, room. Etiquette, Etiquette rules. Rules. Like, he told we, me... We got to organize these leagues for the for the listeners out there. There's way yes, too much Mark. nonsense going on. So chicklets, et cetera. We're going to give them a rule every week to live by in the beer league. And I want to know your guys' take on this uh, on the team showering. There's dudes that come to these games and I know they're playing either early in the morning. They got to get to work. So you better shower. They're going to go home, get on their suit or they're at late at night. But you got to shower after the game. You got to get in the shower with the boys. Like, Busy, you know this, the best part of the game. You played with Keith Yandel. Great story. He always got you to shower, even when you didn't play. Listen, if you're on a beer league, you got to shower. This team and this guy that I know told me that they have a shower sheriff. He's on the team and he hands out tickets to the boys. You get fined if you don't take a shower after the game. <laughs> right up the ideal of Keith Yandel's heart of showering with the fellas and they, he gets everyone in the shower all together. If there's room for that. And he makes sure everyone showers. Is that it? Is that something we need to Talk clean watch. up in this game? In the beer uh, I'm, I'm down with that. The shower sheriff. That. The only thing I'll say is if you get a guy and he's like, fellas, the kids are off to school. Say it's an early skate, right? So you get the 6 a.m. skate. Some guys do that. And the wife says, hey, honey, come home. We can get after it in the shower. We'll take a shower together. And that's the only acceptable reason to not shower after hockey with the boys. Cause you, you may be getting lucky with the wifey. Cause home. that rarely happens. So we understand. Oh yeah. yeah. It's like once a year. So you should, <laughs> yeah. you just one Lunar shower eclipse. a year. Yeah. That's like the, uh, <laughs> that's like the, the, that's like the one excuse your cock from your job <laughs> trap. <laughs> I, I, I love showering. I love sh- like post anything like now I'm golf and post post golf guys will take a shower. Now, unfortunately, all the courses, they don't where, have the hockey locker room showers where you're all together. Where they you got a big the shower whacker. Individual sacks <laughs> showers are horrendous. You yeah, well, those are brutal. You got to have the group shower. Am I shower what? whacker? What's that? Well, you, you like whacking in the shower with the old lady. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get after whacker. I'll get after it with her anywhere she asked me to. <laughs> <laughs> now but that you, you got you, all those you, kids, you're in the closet on the floor with the you, lock on the door. You, you know, made it the seem like barking. the shower. The shower location is your guys' meetup spot. <laughs> if I'm lucky enough, dude, we got a big old shower with a bench in there. So, I, I, so I'm a little bit OCD in a sense of I like feeling really clean. So. I can understand if the rink's close to home and wanting to go home and have your own shower and then put on clothes because sometimes like you're drying off at the rink. It's just like so so steamy in there. It's like gross in the locker room. The floors are disgusting. So I could see where if guys want to go home and get the shower done, I don't really give a fuck about somebody else's hygiene, to be quite frank. Like if they're if I don't get to stare at their cock in the shower, I'm not gonna stomp my feet. More, more room for the rest of us. I do appreciate the guy on the team who's the designated shampoo and conditioner guy because you know that most of the team ain't bringing yeah. it. Yeah, you borrow and, the guy's shampoo. And, and, and maybe, <laughs> maybe the guy, hey, bud, maybe the guy's even got an extra towel. Yeah. Oh, while. yeah. Just don't wipe your butt, right? Like that's yeah. the move. Gee, what's your take on, on the shower sheriff? Do we need one? Uh, what's the deal here? I just think what Army Merle's Game Notes is doing for the beer leagues, they're cleaning it up. Every week, every episode, they put out a, a new rule, a, a different rule that needs to be done, whether it's, you know, cleaning up your uniform, gear wear, you know, bringing beers to the locker room. They have all these different rules and you got to abide by them. So I love what they're doing for the beer leagues, including the shower sheriff. You got to be showering after games. You got to. Yeah, unless you're going right home, I suppose. But once again, thanks to the Game Notes boys. It's been an awesome addition to the fan this year. Next up, another one of these interviews we got, well, we were over the moon for it, Yarmir Yager, uh, and when he told the story of, about Mario Lemieux coming back, well, I'll send it over to Yags. He does it better than I do. I'll never forget. I think it was a couple days after Christmas when Mario returned that time in 2000, and right away, I mean, you score, he assists on the goal early on. It's like, did you guys know he was coming back? I think it had been 44 months since he retired in 97, and when did you guys start hearing he was coming back? Like, do you remember all that? Well, I, I I got the I got the story for you guys. I don't know. Maybe it's gonna be too long, but I have a story. No, how no, I no, 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 no. We got all night, buddy. Yeah, yeah it's 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 kind of exciting. You know, it's my f- favorite stories 
you know, with, with the Mario, how he decided, when he decided, and uh, and and how I how I how he let me know. So, uh, uh, well, when he decided to come back again because he was three years, three and a half years out. So he, he had a you know he had a son you know Austin, and uh, and uh, he, he was always when we play Mario. You know, he was the owner and he was, he was always playing, you know, with the stick in our dressing room. And there was a, a trainer, uh, Steve Latin, and he had a big poster when he was shopping the skates of Mario Lemieux. And little Austin was playing with the stick and he asked Steve Latin, who, who is this guy? And, uh, and Stevie Latin told him, that's your dad. And Austin said, my dad played hockey. And Steve Latin said, your dad was the best player in the world for a long time. So, and somehow, this this conversation, Austin and Steve Lawton get to the Mario. And I think that they click him, and I think because of this, he decided to come back and show his son how good he was. Wow. You know, that's, 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 a, that's a story. I think that's happened, you know. And uh, so... I think Mario started practicing. He didn't tell anybody. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of had a tough start at that season. It was 1999, and, you know, 2000. It was, a, it was 2000, 2001. But I had a kind of tough tough season, tough start. And, uh, you know, and I was, Craig Patrick called me to, you know, we were in Boston and Craig Patrick, our GM, you know, called me and said, you know, when we come back to Pittsburgh, Mario, Mario one attacked, so we we came back from Boston from the trip, and you know I went to his office, and uh, he said, "What's going on?" I said, "Well, you know, we don't play very well. I, you know, I don't play very well. I would like to get you know some players, but I know we don't have the money, and you know we were in bankruptcy back then, and uh, and he said." Well, I, I know one guy who, who could be good. I said, well, you know, <laughs> but it was so funny. And he, I, I, I didn't get it back then. I, I, I didn't, and he, I said, well, you know, okay, but we don't have the money. It cannot be any superstar. I said, well, he's, you know, he might be pretty cheap, and he's pretty good. I, I, I said, well, who is it? And he said, it's me. I'm practicing already for two months. I don't tell anybody, but, you know, I decided to come back uh, on uh, December 26th, that's why I found out, you know. And it was tough, it was tough for me to, to keep it for myself. I didn't tell anybody, but because Mary was afraid, we tell, you know, the media is going to be there all the time. So, but that kind of news, you know, it was probably the toughest thing for me to keep, to keep a secret. Don't tell anybody, you know, just that's, that's how I found out. That is an incredible and, uh, story. And we, we, we cl yeah, we click right away. I, I, I think it's a great story. And, uh, you know, we scored a you know first shift. He, we scored a goal. He scored a, he well uh, he scored he scored a goal in the middle of the game. And you know, we won five. I think five one or five nothing against Toronto. And you know, he had like three points. Next game, he had other three points, four points. It was unbelievable. It was, and that's the other story. How many how many how many professional players? I mean, doesn't have to be hockey or any any sports. Can maybe Michael Jordan can you know take a three and a half years off and you know come back practice for three months and, and dominating you know he, he he played 40 games and he had 80 points but you know it's just that's why i i gotta say hey i lost my game <laughs> in one off season that's why i couldn't play anymore it took me one off season it was a gone this guy's <laughs> fucking taking four years off comes back in just unbelievable that's an incredible story how many people you think know that that story about his kid well, I, you know, uh, I was telling a lot of these stories to my friends in Czech. I don't know if I ever ever, ever say in in uh, in English, so I, I'm not I'm not sure. But it was, you know, it was. I think it was a great story. You know, that's oh, it's, it's incredible. I think there was, the, you know, as a, as a, as a parent, uh, you know, because I remember when Austin was uh, when he was born and in the day, and Mario was in hospital. I, you know, I kind of remember everything about you know, not everything, but most of the time about Mario. So. You know, we played together. It was nineteen, uh, I think, it was nineteen ninety ninety six or ninety ninety seven. I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. But you know, Austin got, you know, he he was born and you know, Mary was in hospital, 
for three days. I didn't, he didn't sleep. He was there. And then we played St. Louis that night and he just came for, for, for the game. And he still had the, you know, the, from the hospital, I don't know how to, how to call it, the rest. On, on a race, he still had it. And I said, hey, keep it. It's, it's good luck for you. And he, he kept it. He scored four, you know, he scored eight, eight points. He scored five goals and three assists. <laughs> 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 okay. Well, I guess it wasn't luck, but it was just very only me. But he, you know, he didn't sleep for three days. He was in hospital and he scored eight points against St. Louis. I mean, just a, an awesome guest. It was uh, top two, top three uh, interview we've done. Just a Hall of Famer who'd never done an interview on a podcast before. And the fact he came on with us is just an honor and a treat. So, And it was midnight. Uh, it was midnight it, in check. He waited up for us. Unbelievable. I mean, the guy stayed up late. I mean, I think he's, probably, he's probably going skating after knowing him what his schedule. But just an honor to have uh, Yags on. And that story was unbelievable. Uh, next up, probably the opposite end of the spectrum, Andre Wah. Definitely in the running for funniest interview, no doubt about it. Top three funny interviews, and uh, he played stewardess uh, on one of the plane trips during the Tampa Bay 04 Cup run, and uh, I'll let him tell the story. Over to Andre. Well, the one that got this all sparked up, and I think I reached out to you via, uh, via Twitter after, was when we had uh, Brad Richards on, and he talked about yeah. the situation in the plane. Now, <laughs> I, I think I remember it being after a big, significant playoff loss, yeah. So walk us through that one. And obviously this is another one, your spur of the moments that that like, is told throughout the entire hockey universe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I've told actually the story quite a bit different events. I do these hockey events anyways, podcasts, but I think it's still for people that never heard it. Uh, so we lost, we're, we're in Philly. It was game six. So we were up by two goals, I think five minutes left. So we're all, yeah, man, we're going to the finals, you know? So they uh, they scored a goal, made it 3-2. They pulled their goalie 3-3, went to overtime, and Philly scored 4-3. So tough loss, I eh? thinking we're going to the finals, game six. So we're going back to uh, Tampa. We're, we're going to on our charter plane. Everybody's bummed out, obviously. Big loss, it hurts, you know, but... Uh, we come in the plane, and uh, as we everybody sits down, uh, one of the stewardess uh, just passed. She fainted. I don't know. We heard like a big boom in the back there. So, you know, one of the trainers ran in the back. They're all looking after her. Obviously, she she's down there. Just oh my god, I don't feel good. I don't know what happened. I'm just so excited, you know. So, um, so as I, I'm, I'm, we just sat on the plane. Marty St. Louis comes. <laughs> And he's like, Andre, you got to do something. I'm like, what are you talking about, Marty? He's like, look at look at this. Look at the plane. Look at the long faces. They all have the Colby Armstrong faces. I was like, yeah, no. So I, <laughs> he's like, what do you want me to do? He's like, do something. We got to cheer. We got to change this move. We got one game left in our barn, game seven. It's not over. I was like, I know, but it's, you know, he's like, no, but just do something. Said, yeah, but towards, you know, he's like, never mind towards go and do something, change that. I was like, okay, what should I do? What should I do? So as the Stewie went down there, I was like, oh, that's what I'll do. I'll serve the meals. So I went in the back and I, the, the other girl was like, hey, do you have any extra aprons? So she's like, uh, why? Why do you want that? I was like, never mind why. Just give me a fucking apron. So <laughs> she's like, they're up. Oh my God. Oh, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Because they, they kind of knew me. So I, I went in the bathroom, got butt naked put on the apron on, you know, had the baby arm hanging in front. And uh, so I go in the back. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> sorry. No, he's not, though. So, no, no, no. No, I'm kidding. So I go in the back. There was the cookie tray that usually they give, they give out after dinner. But I grabbed the cookie tray and I, I kind of put a, a cookie in my ass and my butt crack and I squeezed it, but it could, it all crumbled up anyways. But I, so I, I went up, went by the, the, the two uh, stories, whatever. And I was like, hi guys, I know you're hungry. Are you, would you like a cockle? We got chicken, we got chocolate chip, macadamia. And we got, we got also uh, uh, more stuff coming, but in the meantime, so no, you're good. So, so I was just going all the way up and just with my ass sticking out behind, you know, people, you could see all the, the shit the crumble in my ass i was like no i didn't i didn't poop myself it's just a cookie it's just i squeezed it and it just crumbled in my booty 
So anyways, I just went up. I was trying to just clowning around, you know, and uh, I went all the way up. And then I, I just, my guys were all chuckling and laughing and then having a good chuckle out of it. So I, after a while, I was like, I might as well, you know, so I stay like that. And then the food was kind of coming out. So I started going and giving steaks and salmon to the guys up front, you know, all the way, almost to the coaches up there. Even Everybody was laughing in the plane anyway. So, uh, yeah, so we won game seven because of cooking my ass. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it kind of, it just changed the mood. Kind Guys were laughing. That's and unbelievable I, that St. Yeah. Louis was thinking about it. So you said it was St. Louis came yeah, up? Yeah, yeah, Marty just came up to me. He's like, do something, do wow. something. Like, do something, I, I don't know. So, and Marty, he loves to laugh like yeah, he's in the in he's he's in his seat and he's like Andre Andre come here I five Andre Andre come here and he likes to laugh he laughs just like that so I'm like I give him a high five guys are giving me high fives I'm like anyway so we had a good chuckle. Then after a while, you know, went back oh. to my seat. Guys started playing cards and, uh, you know, uh, started, uh, forgot about the game six. And, uh, yeah. And then that we're, uh, well, we, we, anyways, awesome. it changed the mood, you know. It's just a. Uh, Fucking rights it did, man. Yeah, I yeah, believe exactly. in that shit. I, ju- oh. I just like to, yeah. I just think, Biz, you know, with everybody, you know, it's just a season is so long. And I know you have to be. So and, monotonous. And, yeah, exactly. Right? The meetings we have, the video, and always sometimes it, it gets like it's it's like a record just every day, the same thing, uh, do this, do that, and it gets pretty heavy just to, to handle all that. So I think it's good to have a guy, a good locker room guy, just have fun. And I like to, to, to clown around kind of like that and have the guys uh, laugh once in a while. Yeah, uh, next time you're eating a cookie on your plane, you might want to see where it came from. Check the package first. If it's uh, Andre Waz's name on it, you might want to pass, but uh, all right, just, I think that's a top three chiclet story of all time. Hilarious. I, I had heard snippets of it over the years, G, but like to hear it in person, and, and then when he's got the French accent, it just makes it like 10% funnier. Uh, just an outrageous story, and hey, they won the cup, so you can't knock them. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah, next up, uh, another guy, a controversial fellow we had on, Mike Melbury. Uh, I know not all, all of our fans are huge fans of his, but I thought it was a great interview, and uh, he tells the story of his first NHL fight, and boy, it's a doozy. Take it away, Melbury. All right, before we go any further, here's a word from our friends at Labatt Blue. Hey, guys and gals, lots of things are better together. Hockey, food, going out for a couple cocktails, and a bunch of other things that I'm sure Biz could probably chime in on. But if you really want to take things to the next level, drink some Labatt Blue lights again with your friends and live life to the power of we. We were up in Buffalo last year for the Chicklets Cup. We'll be back there again. It's a big Labatt town. Can't wait to get back there. Hit up the brew house once again because... Labatt Blue Light is the good stuff, so you want to take a page out of the Labatt Blue Light book and enjoy your beers together so you can live life to the power of we. We will see you soon, Buffalo, and to find a Labatt near you, go to Labatt.com. Great Stun Cherry tells a story that he was at a meeting for training camp, and one of my buddies from Colgate, John Hoff, knew Don from Rochester. He was from Rochester, and he said, look out for uh, this Millberry kid. He really works hard, and you'll, you'll like him. And uh, apparently they went through the whole training camp roster and great who said he had a cold that day, said, what about this Mulberry kid or whatever? And uh, that's how I, I made my way onto the training camp roster. It was, um, it was a very interesting experience to go there without, you know, anybody having any expectations for me. I worked out like four times a day. I was... I was in, still living in Walpole. I went north to Stoneham to play with some other college guys in the morning. Came halfway back and did sprints at a public skating facility. Had a nap and then lifted weights and ran in the evening. So by the time, and that was the time when guys weren't working up, right? They were getting cheap. There was like a training camp was like six to eight weeks. So when I got there, I was way ahead of the curve. But I got to tell you, the first thing that struck me was it was Grapes' first year, and they had a they had a tournament at Bolton, the uh, International, and there's Heineken on silver buckets at lunchtime, and then everybody goes and plays golf or tennis, and they come back, and 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 just about everybody was plastered. 
It was, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I'm, I had to get out of there. I had to take a cab home because I was afraid that I was going to join the group. But it was, uh, it was the next morning I go into the locker room. I'm on at the 10 o'clock hour and I'm there at like 7.50. And I walked into the locker room and there's Espo, you know, and he's fudging with his skates just before eight o'clock. And I'm like hiding in the corner. I don't want to say anything to him. He's my hero. But then comes four. And he goes up to Espo and says, Phil, what the fuck are you doing? We didn't win the cup last year. We, you know, there's a brand new coach here, and you're going to be late for the first day of practice. Get your ass out there. And get your ass out there now. I knew it was boss right away. It was, uh, it was, it was just mind-blowing to see that exchange take place. And he didn't say a word back, right? Like no, that no. Was oh, the- he was, you know, that Italian wine started up right away. <laughs> oh, Bob, <wow, wow. laughs> Just get out there, Phil, right? <laughs> but it was um, a lot of people at training camp, a lot of bodies to, to battle. One of them was Wayne Cashman. At one scrimmage, we were facing off against one another. Puck came around the wall, like pinched down, hit him. Soon enough, the puck came right around the same side, pinched down, hit him again. Now he's a little pissed. Third time, he comes around, pinched down on him, and boom, up comes the stick. And not only does the stick come up, the stick comes over and it's turned over. So the blade is pointing down. Now I know we were serious. Fortunately, guys stepped in and got out of the way. But anyway, so I went through training camp, played a few exhibition games for the B squad. And one of the last games I played, exhibition games, was in Springfield. And I'll, I'll never forget it because I got to think, I wish I could think of the guy's name or remember the guy's name because I got to thank him. Um, we had a power play, and I certainly wasn't going to be on the power play, but I jumped out with a few seconds left, so we had five guys to their four, and a fight broke out. And I went over to Dunt Gibson, who was one of our skilled players, and, and somebody had grabbed him, and I grabbed the other guy. And the other guy started throwing punches at me. And uh, I had you know, I listened. I'd been in the stands a couple times at Colgate, but no, there were no fights there, or very few. So when anyway, it started hammering him back and he stopped punching i don't know what the hell he was thinking but he just stopped punching and i looked like the toughest mother in town and it was that was that was a big step in the right direction for me i was off to rochester and uh about five six games later well into october uh we were playing in halifax that was the home of the canadians farm team but they had guys like mario tremblay and risebro were there pretty good team but Tom Johnson who was the assistant general manager took me out to the Chateau Halifax for a Moosehead beer and we negotiated a contract literally on a cocktail nap and that's how my career got started did you even consider <laughs> like oh, I gotta kind of call an agent or is it like nope no no I tell you what I did at that time they had three-way contracts they had NHL AHL and and CHL and so Tom tried to uh, slip that one past me. I said, Tom, I said, Mr. Johnson probably was what I said. I said, I'm, I can, I just came out of Colgate. I can make more money selling insurance or getting a job than I can in the CHL. I'm not putting that in my contract. So he took it up, which was my hard nose ability to negotiate with him. That's unbelievable. You kind of, it sounded to me like it wasn't even necessarily in your mind, like, all right, to make it, I'm going to have to throw him. Like, did you kind of know that was the case or was it more that one fight kind of led other people to believe this is going to be one of his roles? Because then you got to the uh, NHL and you did it a lot. I don't know. It just sort of came naturally. And I watched the Bruins. The Bruins were fighting everybody all the time. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they were role models in a good way back then. And I knew it was somebody my size, you know, I wasn't going to go unnoticed. I was 6'2", which 6'2", at that time, was a big guy. I was not a a small guy. But I will tell you, by the way, there were probably a handful of Americans in the game. Goddamn Canadians were. Talk about prejudice. Pissed me off. You know, I had guys come up to me at training camp like Bobby Schwartz and said, slow down, kid, you're making us look bad. You also said, what did you do all summer, work in a car wash? Because I wasn't tanned at all. (laughs) <laughs> uh, but uh, it was a struggle to get past, to get some respect from some of those guys. And some of it was 
gained by the fighting aspect of it because I think people respected that at the time. Mike, since we're on all the scrapping conversation, I think one of the most iconic fighting moments in uh, NHL history was at MSG when you found your way into the crowd and started beating a man with a shoe. It's one of the best YouTube through. clips of all time. It's, it's one of the greatest hockey clips of all time. It's just straight out of the it's slap kind of shot. Like a, uh, well, you'd know around here because you're living in Milton, you'd see it every time at Christmas. It's like a it's like seeing the Christmas Carol or something, you know? It's <laughs> yeah. on every year at the same time. You know time. it's coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Madison Square Garden at the time was not a very good place to play. I mean, you, they'd throw shit at you. They'd throw batteries or empty bottles, and there was no security getting through the gate at that time. You just came in with whatever you came in with. And the glass so, was low, right? And it was low. Yeah. So, anyway... Good game, two good teams playing. Espo had a breakaway with 10 seconds to go, and it was funny. Somebody from the stands, must have been a Bruins fan, threw a tennis ball right in front of Espo when he was going on on the breakaway, and he missed the shot. He always blames that tennis ball for why he missed the shot on Cheesy. But anyway, that was 10 seconds to go. The, the, the horn sounds I, like everybody does, rush out to congratulate the goalie. And then because I know it's Madison Square Garden, Right off the ice. I go right into the locker room. It's two days before Christmas. We won the game. The Budweiser's on ice in the locker room. Cold. We're ready to go. Going to be in Christmas holiday. And nobody follows me in. I'm like, what the hell? And so finally, Cheevers came in. And I said, well, Jerry, where is everybody? He said, there's some sort of beef going on there. So, you know, teammates do what teammates do. I run back I, I left my gloves my stick everything in the locker room and i i get to the ice level at madison square garden you guys know where the visitors jump up they jump onto the ice and i the stairs are to the left i never got to the ice surface i just walked up the stairs and i see o'reilly McNabb, and and a bunch of other guys but McNabb's up highest and he's my buddy he sit beside him in the locker room so i gotta go up there and you know He's already got the guy over the chair so his feet are up in the air, right? And I have no fucking clue why I'm there. Why, why am I here? Why am I in this position? I, what I, happened? I went from my, I was singing Christmas carols to my heart was racing like a thousand beats a minute. It was just, it was nuts. So I, you know, I gave him a, I just took, I don't know what happened there. I just had a brain cramp and grabbed his shoe, shitty little penny loafer and hit him on the thigh. And, you know, you would have thought over the next three days, the number of times they saw that, that play, that you would think that I'd committed, you know, murder. It was just, it was just, they actually did a study at BU. Uh, they showed the clip once, and then they asked the students, how many times did he hit him? Most said three, four, five. Most said, where, where did he hit him? Most said in the head or upside the face or something like that. It was one little whack of a penny loafer on his leg. So... I got six games, no satisfaction really from not being able to smack the guy. By the way, down below, guys would go into town on some of these other fans. <laughs> they were getting their licks in really good. I didn't, I didn't do anything. You were the distraction with the shoe, and you yeah. got ching, you got ching, well, yeah, ching, yeah, five hundred dollars, right? Five hundred bucks you got fined. Well, I forget what the fine was. It was whatever the maximum was, but they did take care of it back then. They took care of it, and we didn't lose any money, and we did appeal it. Those fans sued us for $7 million at the time, by the way. That got thrown out, fortunately. Um, and we did appeal it. It was, I guess, a very close vote. But if you vote to overturn the commissioner's decision like that, it's tantamount to telling him to resign. It was little twitty John Ziegler was the commissioner at the time. I can remember him skipping out as he had won. <laughs> Just me off. I mean, love him, I hate him, man. Milbury, he's an entertainer. Hey, G. All right, and one thing you said before we sent it to the interview was, you know, not, not a lot of fans liked Mike Milbury when we did this interview, but I think a lot of fans liked him after we did the interview because it was one of those interviews where you'd see all the comments were like, wow, I hated this guy. But then I listened to this interview and I, I kind of love him now. So I think uh, I, I love that interview so much, not only because Milbury is, you know, a, a Bruins legend, but mainly just because, uh, you know, so many people turned on Millberry, and I think that's one of the coolest things that we can do. Yeah, it, it happens quite a bit with players, and I, I guess it's a compliment to us that, you know, people hate a guy, then they listen to him on the show, and then they like him after. So 
I don't know, little uh, NHL spin doctrine over here. So next up, Big Z, and another interview I personally was over the moon for. We did this back in Boston. We had our little homecoming weekend here. Uh, he talked about going from junior B to the NHL, from getting drafted. Just uh, an unreal story from Big Z, so we're going to send it over to him right now. Before I go any further, here's a word from our friends at Peter Mala. Hey, guys. Summer is in full swing, and this time of year can definitely bring the heat. That's why we want to tell you about the new line of performance polos from our friends at Peter Mala. These polos are made from an incredible performance jersey fabric that keeps you cool even on the hottest days. Four-way stretch and moisture wicking properties make sure that nothing gets in the way of your game. These polos also feature UPF protection to block harmful rays from the sun, and with all new colors, patterns, and prints, this season's lineup is sure to keep you playing and looking your best. Be sure to head over to petermillard.com slash chicklets to check out the full line of performance apparel. The practices which we had as a junior B teams or B leagues were very late. So at that point when I was cut and I was, I had to play for different uh, teams which were away from trenching and I had to commute, I had to take trains, I had to take buses. So I had to go and, and I would play, you know, uh, one year in Piestani, which is uh, about 40. Isn't know. that the capital? No, no, no. It's oh, good call, uh, Brat- oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's Bratislava. <laughs> Bratislava. <laughs> See, I know my shit with. Yeah, yeah. No, Piestani is about, uh, I would say, 45 kilometers from Trenčín. And uh, that was one year I played there. The next year, ne- next year I played in Dubnica, which is uh, closer. But I, I was just basically commuting by, by trains or, or buses and... You know, when you're on the B squad, you are having practices after eight squads. So, yeah. you know, they, there was like, hey, you know, there's some, you know, 9, 30, 10 p.m., you know, open eyes. Okay, let's give it to the B squad. And that's what we did. We just skated it so late. So by the time the practice was over, you're gassed. I'm taking, I'm taking a train and coming home at 11.30 midnight. Jesus and Christ. I had to get up at 6 for 7 o'clock school or 7.05 sometimes, you know. Like, so it was like... It was tough, but the, you the, loved it. You, you didn't, you, and it wasn't even I, was it even about making the A squad, or you like you had those goals, or are you just loving the game so much, you're just enjoying every day in a sense. I didn't love it, but I didn't want to give up. I mean, it's a it's a kind of a, a balance that, despite all the you know, like I said, challenges or people telling me you know you should give up, you should quit, you should play basketball, and you are not good enough, and this and that. I just hated to satisfy them or please them by saying, okay, I, I had enough. I just kept kind of like believing it and I, I stick with it. And uh, it was very good that that I had very few people who said, you know, stay with it. Like, don't listen to them. You know, like, it just gives you that little hope. It gives you that little, you know, a match that, that you kind of like burn later on. But I was just like so committed to like prove them wrong. Yeah that I said, I'm not going to give up. And eventually it, it just, you know, it happened. That, so you're it, telling me when you're playing there in, in, for the B team, there's no doubt in your mind that you're going to find a way to get to the NHL. No, no. I mean, it, I, I just had, at that point, you, NHL, that's like, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was not even like in a picture. I mean, that was like, for me personally, it was just like, I'm not going to give up. Like, I didn't know what was ahead of me. So you what didn't was, know the goal, what the, uh, the end goal was. Yeah, I mean, you, my vision was, was or, or the goal setting was was short. Like, it was like, hey, yeah. stick with it, keep working, uh, finish the season, and, and be, a, be a, as, as good as you can, and, and keep working, keep, keep, keep trying, you know, never give up. And then, you know, all of a sudden, like, I got a break. And the break came when we had a game, our B squad, we had a game right after the A squad team, Dukla, and we played in Trenchin. So all the scouts who came to see the A squad um, went to the you know buffet uh, or the restaurant, the, the the ring restaurant and, and cafeteria, whatever you want to call it. And while they were having whatever meal or, or coffee, and they were making notes about the players, we came on the ice for warm up. They're forced to watch it, in a and then all of a sudden they're like, "Wait a minute! Like there is this kid, like." He can skate, he's big, he's this. And then, like, who is this? Why is he in B squad? So, all of a sudden, like, that word somehow must have spread out, right? And now the coach from B squad is telling me, look, like, I'm having scouts, NHL scouts asking about you. All of a sudden, my 
my attitude, my my hope, my my you know, it was I was so encouraged, I was so happy, I was That's so awesome. motivated, like all of a sudden like what? Like okay. It's working. Like I, it's something, right? Like there is a hope. There is hope, there is something, right? Like so I, I kind of like you know, I got a you know, it was a little bit of, of that that reward in a in a, in a in a distance, but I, I was like, listen, just just keep going at it. And then it was pretty regular now that that my my dad even was telling me like, hey, we're getting phone calls from these people, scouts in Europe, coming and asking me when you're gonna play the game and they wanna come and watch you. And so now it's on, right? Yeah. Like I'm like I'm in the basement. I, I was always working on, but I'm like now I'm going twice as hard, you know, twice as long, and I'm just like I'm extra motivated and. Uh, eventually came to the point where we took the registration hockey uh, license uh, as a player and uh, I got uh, transferred or we, we took the, you know, the, 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 the registration and we went to Sparta Prague and I was able to practice with the men's team and play for the uh, uh, Sparta Prague Junior A team which is like another level from yeah did that mean moving like and like living yeah. there yeah i i moved i was living in in prague did your parents go or was it just you no just, just me i was staying in like a one a, one room one bedroom apartment um was like a <laughs> size of this basically hotel room <laughs> on my own no car Seven, 17 years old I or was 17 18 years old yeah yeah, went to Czech Republic and just, uh, yeah, that was it. I just finished the, basically high school. I graduated from high school and went, went right to the uh, Prague. And when you're talking off ice, you're in the basement, was it always lifting, working out, or were you stick handling, were you shooting pucks, Was it or was it more just like for your body? Everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was able to, uh, under the guidance of my dad, um, you know, develop pretty basic regime, workout regime. It was like, you know, Monday, upper body, uh, Tuesday, you know, shooting, uh, Wednesday, legs, you know, so whatever it was. But I always like had three, three time, three times a day uh, working out. So it was just basically running, biking, you know, skipping, uh, shooting pucks. It was just a... So we, we created different drills, different tools, yeah. and uh, it was constantly, uh, uh, you know, working, working, working. Was it in Prague where, where you were maybe, were you, I don't know if you were drafted to the WHL, but how were you discovered to come over to, to yeah. North America? Yeah, that's a great question. So once I was in Prague, it was kind of, like I said, it was already out there that there's, you know, a lengthy kid with potential. That was it. You were like William Wallace. That you were this like that, that was it. You know, there's those cell phones back yeah, then. So nothing. it's just like there's and this it, guy, he's fucking six eleven, yeah. seven one, yeah. seven eight. <laughs> Lightning bolts out of his yeah, arse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fifty man. Yeah. Fifty. But <laughs> yeah, I mean that's so fifty it, it was like you were a project, but there was so much potential they saw. He told you I guess fifty so. men. <laughs> uh, I guess so. But no, in Prague, directly in Prague was a scout uh name of Karl Pavlik, um, who um, basically recorded on VH, uh, VHS tapes, I remember those. So he kind of recorded uh, me skating, practicing, uh, me lifting in the gym, and he sent those tapes to obviously the Islanders. And uh, Mike saw them, and uh, Chris Pry was the uh, director of player development. And uh, based on that tape, I got drafted. No way. Yeah, yeah, that was it. Nobody saw me really from, I was under the radar. like. At that time, uh, the um, uh, Yuri, Yuri Hanish was the uh, uh, agent who, who was working with uh, uh, another agent here. And uh, they brought me to the draft. And basically they said, like, look, like, we believe if we take you to the draft and you go through the interviews and they see you, it will, it will bring you up even more and, and somebody's going to take a chance. And sure enough, that's, that's what happened. It was totally unexpected and I was so grateful and, and honored. And it was a, such a privilege to be drafted. Like I imagine that 12 months prior to that, I was playing on junior B team, B squad with 12 guys with no sticks. <laughs> Uh, Band broke, to get the skate sharpened. and outside the ring with no glass and just the nets behind the net. Like it was just crazy. Like it was. I, I uh, <laughs> thinking back now, I was like, what, what, what happened? Like it's just, uh, yeah. I have so many like different questions I want to ask from here. So, so 
Mike Milbury saw these videos. Now, do you still have these VHS tapes? I'm sure there are somewhere. Oh yeah. man, I would love to yeah. see you just yeah. chucking weights as, as a young guy on these. No, VHS. it was it was uh, yeah. I I remember because um, when I showed up at the uh, the men's team in Prague and we went to the gym, I was pretty much out lifting the men. Because I was just so much, I was used to just lifting and, yeah. and being so strong. So obviously these guys were like, this kid must be on steroids. Like, what is he doing? Like, this is 18-year-old kid and lifting this much. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm on steroids, whatever. <laughs> and uh, so, Test him. so, yeah, and these days Mike saw it and he told me later on that he didn't really want to take me in the 56 overall. But the scouts, the Swedish scouts, convince him like you got to take him because if you don't take him i think phoenix was next or somebody was like yeah god like, damn it they <laughs> said like yeah we're gonna we're gonna take him for sure they had some word you know it was my probably not a swedish guy working for phoenix like we're gonna take him for sure like so they convinced mike and mike said like okay but he never saw me live he never basically just saw it that we, you know vhs tape so were you drafted to the nhl before you were either drafted or invited to go play in the whl yes so it was the Islanders that probably set that up, or so yeah, I got drafted. They wanted you to come over, I'm guessing. So I was already over. I was in uh, I was in St. Louis, um, and then we got a call from uh, WHL um, because they because I told my agent like I I want to stay here. I I don't want to go back. I didn't tell my parents too. I went to the draft. I had a small bag, one pair of jeans. Like, I'm staying here. And I said I decided right there and then that I'm staying. I don't want to go back because number of reasons mainly because if i go back uh i'm gonna end up i have to go surf uh at that time 18 18 months uh, uh the mandatory military service and i didn't have guarantee i'm gonna play for duke law trenching because i already left right i took my reg registration card and i went you know to czech republic so now they will be probably upset that i left yeah I would be maybe ending up in different spot that that some base that didn't allow to play hockey while you served that. So eighteen months would go be I'll be I'll be done like yeah you know, and at that time I think that um, to ask uh, New York Islanders organization to pay whatever the uh, the bounty whatever the the fee whatever they need for for me to 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 get me out of it would be almost impossible right they wouldn't be willing to pay it at that time so i yeah of course and then so i decided to stay of course you know a few weeks later uh my dad's phone like hey there's like military service looking for you oh, like you, no deserted, shit. you deserted the yeah the uh, uh you know the service the 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 country uh, obligation i was like i know but this is important so i couldn't go back home for two years i stayed i stayed you know so going back i got drafted got a call from uh, whl uh, and um dennis palonic you might guys know him he was a gm at that time for prince george cougars and he's like we have a you know i think it was like third pick or second pick whatever he's like we want to know if we you know pick you if you're gonna come to yeah. pg i'm like yeah of course he's like are you sure because you know i don't know if you know where pg is i'm like i don't care <laughs> yeah. that's, it. I, that's I, probably I, the best case scenario i have this i always heard it's in the middle of nowhere yeah, right yeah. Pretty sure. and i had no idea where it was and i didn't care yep. because i just wanted to stay i wanted to have a chance and you know learn the culture learn the hockey style learn the language better um so i said yeah for sure i'm gonna stay you know, okay, so that's what happened. They they chose me. They picked me for um, you know, and I went to uh, stay the summer in Edmonton. Had a beautiful Billet family, uh, Jonathan Aiken family, uh, who was with high the Bruins, pick with the Bruins, Bruins right? in nineteen ninety six first round. So I stay with them. Um, it was a it was a great setup. Uh, worked out at the um, Edmonton University with Pete Friesen at that time who ended up actually, he was working with the Carolina Hurricanes for a long time as a strength and conditioning coach. And then before the season, went to Prince George and uh, played the season in Prince George. Ah, uh, we got to get to 2011, of course. Uh, during that run, you know, you guys were down 0-2 to Montreal, go to seven games with them, down 2 to Vancouver. Uh, was there any moments of doubt whether you personally or the guys in the room, maybe not talking about it, but, you know, it was kind of a little hairy there. You yeah, the and, like, on the road. and after the, the Vancouver 0-2, was there something you said? Was there something anyone said to, to really get this thing going again back in Boston? Yeah, the biggest, biggest help for us was to to have Mark Recchi and Sean Thornton with us because they they won it and I believe Mark Recchi 
was in the same position with Carolina being down 0-2. Don't know against who, but... Was uh, it Edmonton? It would have been Edmonton, yeah. Might have yeah. been. Yeah. And he said, guys, like, I, I've been there. Like, we okay. Like, just, just, he spoke probably the most, which was awesome to have because none of us been been there. And, and, and again, we were like, just going off that Philadelphia, yeah. right? And we was like, here we go again. Like, no way this is happening again. And, and, and he was such a calm factor for us and just build the confidence back up to us. Um, so all the credit and kudos go to, to those two guys because they really handle it well for us to kind of like stay calm. We're gonna go to Montreal, we're gonna take first game and we're gonna break it down to first period, second period, third period. First period, first shift, second shift, third shift. And that's how we broke it down, literally shift by the shift. We couldn't believe it. It was just like, just these short goals and one at a time. And we, we, we tied the series and obviously then ended up winning game seven. But um, to have, again, experienced guys who's been there, who won and, and just to keep that group and that team, um, you know, steady and not panicking and, and it was huge. Were you the type of guy who would get nervous before games? And, and, and if not, were you nervous before that game seven? Yes, I, I always got nervous before the games, but not nervous scared, but nervous, just, just excited nervous, right? And the only game I was not nervous was my first NHL game, going back to 1997. I, 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 I don't know why. Maybe just so excited. <laughs> I was just like, okay, like, what what I have to lose? Like, yeah. <laughs> Detroit Red Wings, uh, Stanley Cup champions. <laughs> oh, here you go, Federov, uh, Lindstrom, Larion. Minus oh, four. Okay. <laughs> no, actually, I've been plus two that game. Oh, okay. Shit. Suck on that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. never Wait. been plus You're two. You're not talking about yourself. <laughs> he has no, a game sheet at home. I have a game sheet that I play like less than 10 minutes. But but we, we won actually 3-1 that game. Uh, but uh, yeah, since then, every game I got some butterflies. I was like nervous. Like I was just like, uh, you know, just serious. I was just very serious and always kind of ready for the game. And, and uh, because, you know, I'm facing the best players in the world. That's my task, like that line, that player. It was just, I never felt comfortable enough to be going into the game like, oh, this is gonna be easy. Because as soon as you start doing that. You're pff, done. You were like minus three in first period. Like yeah. you just not. Nah. Your pre-draft interview with Mike Milbury, he asked, can you fight? Do you remember what your answer was back to him? <laughs> I, I don't. I, I don't think remember. you took your shirt off and challenged said, you him. You wanna go, said, Mike? That's why I drafted <laughs> you. You said, better not to fuck with me. And, and you want him over with that, yeah. Oh, okay, no, 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 no. Um, now I remember. See, now I remember. I said, better not piss me off, I think. Okay. Uh, <laughs> see, that's yeah. the Boston yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, translation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Blame the athletic. Yeah. I think I remember. Yeah, now I remember. See, but was it Mike? Yeah, could be Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's he's notorious for his uh, his interviews with draft picks. We had Terry Ryan who came on. A uh, very different uh, type of story. We don't need to get into it. A little bit. Yeah. Now, so at Prince George, like, just told Biz, you fought before. Was you getting challenged a lot by guys because you were a bigger guy? You know, your skating hadn't been fully refined yet. Were guys coming yeah. at you frequently? Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, I think that first, you know, whatever, five to ten games, I must have had a fight pretty much in every game. Um, you know, I, I remember that there was a... I guess the the standard that I had to set that you know Ronald because Ronald Petrovicki was on that team and he said look like they're gonna challenge they, you you're gonna get challenged there's gonna be guys like Rob Skurlak Scott Parker you know it would be it would be coming they tough you know, so, tough they, yeah so I was like all right like I I knew that I'll be challenged and I knew that for me to again make a progress i gotta answer the bell and i gotta i gotta show them that i'm not gonna be pushed around and i'm gonna be standing up sticking up for myself and my teammates and so yeah first whatever um yeah, i must have fights in every game yeah. were you fearful like did you like you know it was coming like let's say pre-game nap were you like oh, no a bit no i i didn't know and that was probably a good thing i i, I didn't know these guys i was like okay well somebody <laughs> oh, okay so <laughs> whoever it is whatever, yeah I, I was like so but then you know, obviously like as you go through the first rounds of fights and you know through the league then you go okay so this guy's obviously much bigger strong and these guys you know different type of fighters so you kind of like prepare mentally for that type of a game but i remember my first fight i didn't even have my arms up 
you know, Ronald is screaming at me from the bench, put your arms up, put your arms up. I'm kind of like going to the fight and I'm like swinging my arms like uh, Conor McGregor and going towards the guy. He's like, <laughs> so like, he's like, you got it. I mean, I did well in that fight. I, I you know, I, I believe I won the fight, but, but then he's like, listen, you got to put your arms up. Like you got to actually set, you know, so then he was actually. Then the next one, they're over your head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's front of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. So it's kind of like these little things. Um, yeah that's amazing did they all, many of them come back for seconds or did they learn their lesson the first time no it was it was i i have so much respect for for the guys i fought um regardless where um you know it was it was it was tough league you know the dub was very very tough um i believe at that time you know probably toughest league uh, oh, from the sure. q's and o's oh uh, you know it was it was definitely w had probably every team had two three guys yeah. that that could fight like heavyweights who end up being actually at some point in the NHL as enforcers. When you ended up, you know, becoming like the Norris Trophy All-Star, uh, say you were 240, 245, at that point, were you still much lighter? Like, when did you become the size you are now in terms of the overall build? So I was very careful adding my weight just because I knew that I didn't want to slow down. I didn't want to weight cost me being... Um, or the weight being an issue of 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 kind of causing me more uh, bad than good. So I was. I remember I I, I was in P Prince George. I was uh, two thirty seven, and then I remember in New York I was about two forty seven. So in span of maybe a year and a half, I gained ten pounds, which is not bad, right? And then slowly, you know, two fifty. I think the heaviest I ever been was two sixty three. All right, guys, before we go any further, let's talk about Bolero. Wednesday marks the start of one of our best summer events, the Bastu Bolero Invitational. Bolero is the world's largest owner and operator of bowling centers with over 325 locations throughout the United States, currently in 34 states. Bolero is known for reinventing one of America's oldest pastimes into a new and unforgettable experience with modern and beautifully designed venues, expansive arcades, premium signature cocktails, and a creative menu. Joining the Invitational is easy. Enter your name and visit any Bolero location near you and bowl for your chance to be entered to win the ultimate grand prize, which includes tickets to the football and basketball championships, plus a trip to the Boston Bolero Invitational finale in Chicago on August 9th. Many will bowl, only one will win. Join Bastu Talent on July 12th at Chelsea Piers in New York City to participate in the Bastu Bolero Invitational, take pitches, and get some free Bastu Sports merch. Visit www.bolero.com slash Bastu to learn more about the Bastu Bolero Invitational starting July 12th. Participation is open until July 23rd. No skill is required. All participants have an equal chance of winning. To find a participating center near you, visit www.bolero.com slash barstool just great stuff from Zdeno Char if you haven't listened to that whole interview I suggest you do uh, another I mean just, everyone seems like a favorite this year but Big Z was awesome so give that a whirl if you have not and next up ah uh, boy Paul Biz Nasty Bissonette with yet another crazy idea if it's not talking about competing with the NFL on Sundays Biz says that beer league players should play in preseason games uh, I just go to biz. Let's just go to biz. Let, let him tell it. Please. Okay. So, Wit, should we mention this group chat that we had going today in, in which Kevin Hayes said, I'm the dumbest person in the world. Oh the the National yeah, Make Biz Happy it. Hockey League. You got to you gotta read some of these texts. I'll, I'll, it, go, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Okay. Let me try to read this real quickly. And this all goes back to the fact that I said, if they're going to throw e-bugs during the regular season, why not have a couple beer leaguers for each team on deck, you know, <laughs> waiting to play if somebody goes down in preseason rather than throwing in an unwarm, you know, guy that, you know, has an opportunity to maybe make the team. Like, it's already a shit show. You're halfway through the game. <laughs> Put some beer leaguers in there for our entertainment. <laughs> so the, the chat is <laughs> Smeek, Bisk, Hazy, and Keith. And, and Hazy writes, Biz, the fact that you think a beer leaguer should play, be able to play in a preseason is so ridiculous. It actually may be one of the most insane things you've said since the pod started. 
I said, I said, even worse than my PK thing. <laughs> so that's PK for Hall of Fame. He says PK for Hall of Fame isn't crazy. He said, but imagine a kid who has a chance to make the team gets less ice time for a beer leaguer because Biz wants to be entertained. <laughs> hey, this is the NHL, but we allow beer leaguers to play on national television. <laughs> Biz sends Biz says that they do it in the regular season with a picture of David Ayers. <laughs> he goes, how is this not crazier? He says, that's a goalie. And that's all predetermined. A player can't go in net, but players can double shift. You can't just be like, okay, Biz, you've only played 38 seconds tonight. You strap on the pads. <laughs> so all of a sudden, Yandel comes comes in. Imagine some dirt ball from Quincy getting to play for the Bruins, and they are playing the Leafs, and whoever he hates, he goes out and smashes a stick over Austin Matthews' head. But at least Biz got to watch it, though. <laughs> there is a couple other ones, too, I think. Yeah, yeah. Gans goes, yeah, you got too many men on the ice. The coach has to culture this horn out. Like, if you don't make it past the ladies' tee in golf. <laughs> oh. Just so Biz can be entertained. <laughs> oh, that was oh. funny. Well, I mean, you got. Hey, if you listen to the podcast, you know I got some dumb fucking takes. I don't give a shit. Hey, dude, I can't you're, even you're, speak you're English half the time. Quake. You're an absolute take quake. It's yeah. great though. Yeah, I mean we're having fun here. But <laughs> hey, I would like to get a poll going, Grinnell. How many people would like to see the beer leaguers out there rather than like? seeing them play short or throwing a guy who's like an AHL or out there for a period and a half. Who's not even warm. Like I'll post it now. I'll post it now and I'll give you the results at the end of the pod. The, yeah. the argument that a beer leaguer could try to injure somebody on the other yeah, team that, is actually pretty valid. When, when, yeah, when I saw that come through, I was like, ah, I never considered that. I never, I never, yeah, I never considered that. So speaking of uh, non pros mixing with the pros, how about that f- uh, clip from the weekend? That idiot ran on the field with the with the red flare and Bobby Wagner and the Rams absolutely fucking trucked him. Did, did you see it, Biz? I sent the. Oh link. yeah. Oh, I mean, what an idiot! And then and then the fan he filed the police report. Like, oh, like, I saw he, that. I, saw, fucking, I didn't know if it was the same story. He's like suing them, isn't he? Yeah, he's trying. It's like, dude, you trespassed with a fucking dangerous situation. These guys don't know what you're fucking out there for. And he truck stick them, knock them down. And now this guy's going to try to try to presumably going to try to sue. I hope they fucking chuck that right out to it. Who cares? The NFL has got billions and billions. Give them a couple hundred grand for our entertainment. <laughs> Yeah, fuck him. Put uh, him yeah. in a put him in an NHL preseason game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that would actually be good. And then put a couple NFL guys on the other team too. Once again, Biz. I mean, nothing more to add there. He's just an absolute beauty, a doozy, whatever name you want to call him. He's a treat to listen to, and that's why we have him on the show. All right, so that's going to wrap up our best of the past season here. Once again, we can't thank our fans enough. I know we did last week. Uh, we could do it every week because again, we're nothing without you guys and gals. Uh, you guys give us the lifeblood to keep doing this every week. So. Hopefully you're enjoying your summer. And also thanks to all the interviewees we had this year and everyone we just uh, dropped this episode as well. It's been a doozy of a summer, so uh, hopefully you're having fun. And we'll be back next week with a fresh new interview for you. Over and out.